is up. Hey. What's up, folks? Bienvenidex, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. We are bringing you the next episode of LA Taco Live with Laura. And listen, it's been a week. A lot has been going on again. I feel like it's Pisces season. Shout out to all the Pisces because I love y'all. But little things are just happening here and there where I'm like, do I have a ghost that's following me? Is it something in the air or the water? I don't know what's going on, but I do know that I'm super excited to bring you this next episode because we have another packed lineup like last week. We have some heavy hitters in the house. Mike Bonin, Diosa Fem, Crisol, just amazing people in the studio today. So I'm excited to bring this fire. Um, just as a reminder for folks that are new to listening, LA Taco Live is a show that puts on or shares the stories, brings on people to the show that we publish about on LATaco.com. So LA Taco is an online publication that puts out stories about news, politics, culture, tacos, trending topics, everything and its mama under the sun regarding Los Angeles. And here we make it come alive. So again, we thank everybody who keeps tuning in. We thank the true fans. We thank everybody who's been supporting us. And if you're new, we encourage you to become a member at LA Taco to make sure that we keep bringing you that fire on publications and here on YouTube as well. We have so many cool things going on. I have a couple of rants this week. You know, we typically start with rants here at LA Taco Live with Laura. And a lot has been going wrong, but a lot of really cool things have been happening. And excitedly, I was actually reached out to by a, pro a Korean producer and director, Wook Jung Lee. So funny story, y'all. I'm chilling at work in December and I get a DM on Instagram that says, hey, what's up? Uh, we're going to be in town from LA. We're from Korea. We'd love to see if we can talk to you about tacos. I said, block. What? No. Uh, scam? What credit card do you want? You know, I was scared. Not gonna lie. Then time passes and it's early January and I get an email. Shout out to Danielle Na. Y'all are dope as hell, but girl, I didn't trust you at first. Talking about, hey, following up again. Uh, we wanted to see if we could reach out to you to talk about tacos for a documentary we're working on attached to some articles and some information about this project. Blocked. Didn't believe him. Got a, got a message on LinkedIn. I said, oh, these scammers are really going in. Blocked. And finally, I get a phone call at work. Shout out again to Danielle now for being persistent because I'm really happy I joined y'all. Essentially, it wasn't a scam. And this past weekend, I got together with Wook Jung Lee and the entire production crew, which is a group of about four different men who are going in with professional cameras, talking to me about tacos as the taco expert that I am, which still makes me giggle sometimes because I do feel like there's so much history and knowledge that I bring to the scene and I need to like validate myself and I'm doing it here out loud with you all. Um, and it's just super exciting when women, I think, primarily get invited to do these opportunities. We see men in the food industry heavy right um and shout out to a lot of people who have been mentors to me but it was really really cool for me to take that time we started at olvera street and they were like tell us about olvera street and i said oh fuck what did i learn in the third grade i don't remember and obviously i know that olvera street is one, of, is one of the oldest streets in los angeles i know that 11 or 10 mexican families were established there because of a rule of some politician it was in the 1800s and guess who wasn't alive back then little on me um but essentially it was a really cool conversation and i also have a bone to pick with problematic latino folks while we were there shout out to Wu jung lee i consider him now the anthony bourdain of korea because he says it's what his vibe is when he's doing projects the project that we were actually filming an episode on about tacos is going to be called food, food chronicles and Wook Jung Lee was sitting down talking about taquitos with me. So we talked about taquitos. I mentioned flautas. We talked about burritos and them not really existing in Mexico, right? And being more of a U.S. thing, what U.S. Mexico food is. And Wook Jung Lee, um, we had some chiles pa morder on the side when having taquitos. So they served us at the, at the establishment. So we're biting into the taquitos, talking about their texture, the design of them, you know, the drip of the guacamole. And Wook Jung Lee said, oh, these chiles are to eat too. And I was like, yeah, so essentially when we're eating tortas or even tacos, some folks, you bite at the taco, then you bite the chile for that extra salsa, right? That extra, that extra spice. I'm a little bit of a chicken shit with spice, so I usually only bite them with tortas because I feel like the torta like deconstructs the spice. Anyway. Wook Jung Lee went, took the serrano, the crunchy serrano pepper, got the red salsa, poured it on top. I wish I had a serrano and salsa. I should have prepped to show y'all and shoved almost the whole thing in his mouth and said, mmm, mmm. And, you know, a couple minutes later, he was suffering. He said, ooh, telling the crew, like, I, need, I might need some water. I, I wanted to warn him, but you know what? He's a badass. Um, and a motherfucker walked by and said, chingatelo chinito. 
And I want to take this opportunity. I wanted to cuss the man out then, but we were we were filming. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to give um, the folks who had access to recordings of me see me in a different light and be famous for other things in Korea. Um, but not all Asian folks are chinitos. For all Latinx communities out there, let's be better. Asiaticos, right? There is. It's like if everyone called everybody Mexicans, right? We know that's not okay either. Uh, or all Latino populations Mexican. So. I wanted to give a big fuck you to that person who told uh, Wook Jung Lee que se lo chingue, even though like I think he was trying to be encouraging. And I also want to give a shout out to Wook Jung Lee because that was a badass move. Um, we also went to Smorgasburg. Shout out to Evil Cooks. I know they were following them around. We had the Poseidon taco, which is their octopus pastor taco. That was really good. We had a burrito from Burritos Las Palmas. And if you were at Smorgasburg this past Sunday and we moved you out of the way a little bit violently because we were filming, apologies, y'all. It was a it was a whole situation where they wanted to get b-roll of me just walking and looking at the stands and all i can see is the actual crew relocating people and bodies were moving and people were looking at me like i was beyonce like who the fuck are they moving us for and they saw little on me Laura Tejeda, what's up? Um, so let's be on the lookout. I don't know when Food Chronicles is going to air. It's going to be aired nationwide in Korea um, for this project. And I'm excited to get into it and to see what's going on. Um, and to see how I came out talking about Overa Street. Hopefully I didn't sound too ridiculous. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on to trending topics. We're switching it up. You know, we were showing you a lot of headlines and things going on. But we also know that trending topics are super popular, whether on Twitter, on IG, on TikTok. And excitedly, today is National Ranch Day. Let's take a look at a video where someone who's super disrespectful is eating, I think, a slice of pizza and has a straw dipped into a, a Hidden Valley Ranch uh, costco size bottle and is sipping. I don't know how y'all out there feel about ranch. I fuck with it heavy. Listen, if a bitch has Jack in the Box taco, it's incomplete if I don't have a little side of buttermilk ranch from Jack. Shout out to Jack. Um, but I would never sip it like this, right? I do put it on pizza. I do, you know, it originated as a salad dressing, I believe. I know people like it with a little dip, with a little, you know, like, uh, what's the fancy word for the chopped up fruit, uh, vegetables? Can't remember. Crudite. <laughs> What's up? Um, but I like it. I just wouldn't go as far as doing that. I will say, though, I would go as far as to sipping salsa out of a little plastic jar. Uh, because when I go to Alan B's Burritos on First Street in, in Boyle Heights, shout out to them. Their salsa that's made with chicharron and, and magic um, is sippable at, with a bite of a burrito and a sip of the salsa, but never with ranch. Um, next up, we just wanted to, to, to mention the, the game in Querétaro where fans were super violent, where a lot of injuries ensued. I was actually looking into this, and I found out that the governor denies any deaths happening, but a lot of fans beg to differ and say that they're almost sure that a lot of people died in the stands at this soccer game. Forgive me, yay sports. Don't remember the exact names of the teams, but folks got down and soccer officials are cracking down and actually um, forcing the folks, the owners of the team, to to sell their the team essentially and they're banned from the stadium for five years a lot happened a lot happened i think a lot of folks are traumatized i do know that the rest of the games for the season for this team will be played behind closed doors no matter where they play and apparently there's going to be a 1.8 mile security parameter that'll be set up around the stadium we talked about it back when we talked about uh the the, the football games can't remember was it the rams or rams fans Y'all, let's do better. Why? That, ¿Por qué nos invitan? Si nos invitamos, ¿por qué se ponen así? Like, I was watching videos of people picking up chairs and throwing them using metal poles to beat each other over a soccer game. <sighs> we need to do better. Um, and I'm still shook that this happened. Um, and then lastly, or no, not lastly, nextly in sports world, MLB is coming back. Apparently, um, the owners and players have reached a tentative deal on a new labor pact, which we were just talking about last week, that we would not be getting our Dodger dogs and our overly priced micheladas and, you know, a little fun in the sun with some baseball. But apparently the season is set to start on April 7th. So it's back on. Um, MLB's minimum salary will start now at $700,000 and increase $20,000 per year. Yes, rich people keep getting richer hope you're doing some good with that money um and so folks are excited it'll be back on april 7th apparently some training games will start as early as march the middle of march which we're already in the second week 
wow, I still feel like I'm 20, I'm in 2020. Uh, but that's going on. So it's back for all you sports, Dodgers, baseball lovers. Um, on the third headline, I want to talk about my girl, Kim K, my fellow Libra. What up, girl? If you're listening, what is up? Como estas? Um, she's trending right now because she made a comment saying that her advice to women who are trying to just come up in the world, I might be like b botching exactly what she said was to just get up and work your ass off and quote, it seems like no one wants to work these days. Listen, I have thoughts. I have many all the time, always. Kim K, problematic. I feel like knowing about all the Kardashian live is unescapable because it's always on the shade room. I open up anything. Even when I open up like Google, right? There's an article or Yahoo or whatever. Um, I just want to ask, girl, who are you talking to? Are you talking to your homegirl Paris or the neighbor down the street, you know, with the ranch and the horses? Or are you talking to working class people? Because there are, there's a lot of things that are conflicting online. There's a lot of folks who are coming to her defense saying that Kim K is the hardest worker I know. We know that she also has been studying to, to become an attorney, essentially, has already passed the baby bar. There's some effort there. But let's talk about resources, Kim K. You know, you could be a hard worker, but when you lack access to child care, um, to a car, especially with gas being so motherfucking high these days, you know, like for a driver. You know, I don't know when the last time you picked up a Clorox wipe and wiped the, the countertop down after making your own cold-pressed juice. I'm talking about me. I have to wipe my countertop almost every day. Um, the, we, we're, we, no somos iguales. We are not the same, baby girl. So, yes, I do not want to invalidate that you probably work hard. But I also want to remind you that this is subjective. And for everybody who's attacking, maybe she's talking to her rich friends, babies. Okay? She, she, she can't be talking to me because a bitch does a lot and a bitch works hard. And guess what? A bitch likes to nap. I also don't have children. See? There's layers. There's nuances. But I would like to think that Kim K wasn't talking to um, working class folk because if you were, baby girl, take 18 seats and run me a little bit of money if you're trying to do that because um, I could use a lot of support myself with paying for gas and doing things that, you know, working class people do. Um, but those are the three things, the, trend, the trending, the trending, the trending topics that caught my eye this week. We're trying to switch it up. We want to bring you the news and we're going to be working really hard to be creative and how we're just pointing out things that are happening so we can continue to chat about them online so y'all can leave comments on the YouTube channel. Um, but stay tuned for, for some more creative ways for us bringing you the news. And we are going to go ahead and take a break and we'll bring it right back with council member Mike Bonin. See you soon. I'm breathing heavy because we're going to try tamales. Yes. Say, it, say it with your chest, Walter. If you're it's more rico, pues, more rico. <laughs> it hits different. A bat comes in, eats the seeds, and then, you know, poops off the seeds around uh, And Jalisco. you need to look for those seeds at the bat poop. <laughs> Y'all, we talked about shrimp poop last week. We're talking about bat poop. Who poops sometimes is important, baby. Veo muchas pedas de vino en tu futuro, yes. I love that. So wineries is your favorite pastime. Yes. You want to shake it? I shake it. Sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw that TikTok where they you show like the people who are like casual, the scariest ones. The, the different ones kinds of bartenders. Let me, not, let me not put egg all over myself. I'm about to have an omelet in my hair. You show up and these fools catfishing. Just mm -hmm. ugly, oh. bad breath. <laughs> Outfits wasted. And for what? For 32 miles? Not down. No. There is no such thing as 32 mile dick. <laughs> <laughs> Not now. I mean, 26 miles maybe. 25 Shout out to you, baby. <laughs> Walter. Walter. Right. Tequila just hits the throat and it's like a, ah, you know, yeah. like mezcal feels like it, it as a party, right? Especially exactly. what you mix it with, yeah, or, yeah. Um, with the orange and all of that. So, yeah. wow. Thanks for bringing that down yeah, for course. me. So I can get nerdy with all the tequila I'm stuff, here for it. Of the tamal de mole from mi ranchito Veracruz. <laughs> <laughs> this is also where we may fight because Laura stays balling on a budget. So yo como pescado catfish. Tilapia, what's the right thing to do oh, and what's the wrong goodness. thing to do? You already said it. We're going to start fighting We're again. We're going to fight again? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't use tilapia for a ceviche okay. at all. When did you get to the point where you knew that you made it? Because when I found out you were going to be a guest on this show, I was tripping. That's when I knew. Yeah. <laughs> And no, I'm Brendan, my manager was like, LA, LA Taco reached out. I was like, oh my God. You're like, it's I'm it. fucking here. It's it. I'm going to crunch it right into the microphone, okay? Yeah. Imagine if I have an allergic reaction to the spice. Oh I'm, my I'm a God, basic bitch. See? But how do you balance being a DJ, a business owner? And I feel like Cumbiaton is another business, Absolutely. right? Like, what does the balance look like for you? And what advice do you have for people who are pursuing these their passions in this way? So here he is. He's, he's breaking windows down. He's got the, sh uh, the shrimp shit there. Laura, do you eat this shrimp shit? 
I love shrimp <laughs> shit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Este va a ser agua chile. Este no va a ir picado muy delgado. Ahora vamos a cortar la mitad. Para que pueda tener textura. También a oh, Osuera Coyote. A mí me agarraron en Tijuana haciendo un coyote también. Por eso es representa esa, esa foto también. ¿Por qué? Porque me traía la. La merca legal. Entonces de, de coyote, pollero, ahora es cevichero. Ahora marisquero. Claro. Dejamos lo malo por lo bueno, dice. Mi favorito honestamente de todo marisco es el pescado. Te voy a hacer un aguachile de pescado. Ese nadie lo va a tener. Entonces, yo nací en Anaheim, California. Yo a los 16 años me fui a Tijuana. Todo se al revés. Los de allá si quieren venir para acá, yo me fui para allá. Todo el mundo me decía que yo estaba loco. Honestamente... A mí me gusta la cultura allá, para mi casa, mi casa es Tijuana. Como este va a ser agua chile, este no va a ir picado muy delgado. Ahora vamos a cortar la mitad, para que pueda tener textura. Exactamente el pescado está crudo, el, pesca, el camarón no te lo voy a cocer, ok? Ahorita lo que vamos a cortar va a ser el pescado, porque el pescado si buscamos que se curta poquito para matar la bacteria. Siempre pimienta fresca, siempre. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad took off at a very young age. So basically all my bullshit, all the headaches, all the complaints, my mom had to deal with them. So she's mom and dad. When I learned this? When I learned to make mariscos, I learned to make mariscos in Popotla. That's where I learned. I moved to Tijuana for six years. When I lived in Tijuana, Estamos haciendo otras cosas que honestamente otra gente no debería de andar haciendo. Yo me la pasaba mucho en lugares de mariscos. Uh, teníamos un amigo que tenía una marisquería. El, el señor comenzó a mirar él que a mí me gustaba el marisco. Me dijo, ¿sabes qué? Juan, vente a la cocina. Te voy a enseñar. Gracias a Dios yo aprendí a hacer marisco por ese señor. ¿Dónde va ceviche rambo? Uh, let me tell you about ceviche rambo, man. 2019. Es when I won my first title. I went back 2020 and I took it again. They won't let me compete no more because they think I'm buying the competitions. My work speaks for itself, honestly. So, what can I say? Two time champ, back to back. I'm kidding. Honestamente, para mí, mi favorito es el pescado. Un tipo con mexicano siempre camarón, camarón, camarón. Cada siempre lo miran como lo más bajo. Honestamente. Si tú hablas con un japonés, un japonés sí te respeta el pescado, porque ellos comen mucho sushi, aquí sí. Mm -hmm. That fish, that quality of the fish, nice thick cut. I appreciate that he's not chopping it up and grinding it up. Almost like a sashimi cut. That's an excellent aguachile de pescado. Probably the first aguachile de pescado I've had. The Kevin Baca style. Before I say bye to you guys, I want to say thank you to Ale Taco again. And if you guys want to find me, go find me on IG at Kevin Baja style. You can find me in Paris, or sometimes you might have to chase me because I bounce from city to city. I gotta share the love. What's up, folks? We are back with our first guest of LA Taco Live with Laura this week. We have Mike Bonin in the house. Hey. Council member for the 11th District of Los Angeles. The applause is a little bit late Ooh, sometimes. I, you know? I like that applause. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the studio, Mike. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You're Glad good. Yeah. You're in traffic getting here. The traffic sucked, but... Um, yeah, but you're here. It, it, it's about in this case, it's about the destination, not the journey. So. Right. Yep. And we're happy you're here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we were just talking about Kim Kardashian, and I have to have you share this story. You know, Mike Bonin was attacked as well by the Kardashians to a different capacity back in when 2013. Yeah, I think it was like 14 <laughs> or 15 or so. I, I wasn't hadn't been in office too long, and all of a sudden I woke up one morning and like Twitter's going nuts and my emails going nuts and people were saying there was these explosions in the marina <laughs> last night. You know, I represent the West side, which includes Marina Del Rey mm -hmm. and LAX and, and, and all that. And it turned out the Kardashians on a Tuesday night, I think it was in September, 
um, were uh, having a party. And as the Kardashians do when they have a party in the marina, they had a fireworks show. Lord. Uh, off the, the thing. And so people, nobody knew it was happening. Some people who lived near the airport thought there was an attack at the airport. Oh, my god! People could hear it from, like, Manhattan Beach all the way up to, like, Brentwood. And we're terrified. So people were freaking out. And and Harvey Levin from TMZ lives in like Venice or Marina del Rey. So he was, before 7 a.m., he's like, what are you doing about this? <laughs> and it's actually, the water is actually the county. It's not the city. So mm-hmm. nothing I can do. But so I started getting into it and started criticizing the county for it. And next thing you know, there's a whole Kardashian thing. My relatives are calling me from back east saying, yeah, we were at the, at the hairdressers and we saw your name in Us Magazine and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, that, that and getting arrested protesting Trump's immigration stuff were my two sort of brushes with, I guess, national coverage. Wow, I can't believe it. The Tr- Kardashians are going up on a Tuesday. What's funny, though, is if that happened in East L.A., we'd just be like, oh, what, what sports won? What sports won, right? I was like, I would not be alarmed, but I guess it is a little bit scary when you're not used to it on a Tuesday. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, let's get into you. Sure. Here at L.A. Taco Live, we'd like to just break down into who you really are as a person. We know you do amazing work for community at, at different capacities, uh, but Tell us about yourself. In your own words, if you had to explain to someone who was an alien coming to Earth, what would you say? Oh, well, I think being a council member would be a little bit down the list. I think the, <laughs> uh, I think the first thing I would probably say is that I'm a father of mm. an amazing little eight-year-old mm. uh, who I think is going to be on the Supreme Court someday. He's a little lawyer. He argues me out of everything. Just an amazing, We amazing love kid. that. My husband and I uh, adopted him about six and a half years ago, and it's the best thing I've ever done. Uh, I'm a husband, I'm a son, uh, and I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. I've been sober a little over 27 years. Congratulations. Thank you. That's yeah. awesome. I think those are sort of the headlines for me. Yeah, that's great. Um, so going into the fact that you are a council member, because that is a big deal, right? What does a day in the life look like for you? We have folks at LA Taco who are so interested in all the work that you've done. Shout out to Lex. He asked, <laughs> I would be so interested to know um, what a day in the life for you looks like as a council member. Uh, there, There is no typical day. And what Whatever you think your day is going to be, it's going to be something different. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because the job of a council member in LA has so many things to it, right? I mean, you're you're sort of dealing with legislation for the whole city. You're mm-hmm. dealing with big issues like, you know, uh, police abuse and homelessness. But you're also dealing with little stuff about, you know, the swing set at my kid's park is broken, mm. right? So it, it, it's all sorts of stuff. And th- there's a ton of wasted time meetings you do. Like city council meetings, most of what goes on there is... That's not the real work. Right? Mm-hmm. The real work is in the community. It's occasionally when you pass stuff, but it's a lot of time in, frankly, boring meetings. My eight-year-old, when he comes to work with me, he describes the council chambers as the boring room. Uh, <laughs> and, He's like, nothing goes down here. And, and he ain't that far off. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, then there's, there's meetings in the community. Like th- this morning, I was at 8 o'clock. I was at a local elementary school. Uh, with kids who were showing me their uh, safe routes to school and the safety program that they themselves as fourth and fifth graders had put together. Wow. Uh, but it could be, you know, it's also been, you know, a 500 person meeting where me and the mayor are getting yelled at because we were planning and did put a homeless shelter in Venice. So mm. it's it, it's wild and unpredictable. It's never boring. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not always fun, but yeah. it's never boring. A lot, a lot that's going on yeah. as you're doing the work. Never boring, except for the council meetings. That yeah, except boring. for the chambers, right? Yeah. You got to listen to it. What's your, what's your son's name? Jacob. Jacob. Got to listen to Jacob. Yep. Um, how did you get to this journey? Like, where? how did you get to becoming council member? Who were you before that? Ah, well, that's uh, th- that's an interesting... There's, there's two parts to that. One is, how did I get to be a council member? And then I think a second one is, how did I get to be the council member I am now? Because mm-hmm. I think I'm a lot different than when I started. Is... Um, uh, I had been in college. I was an activist. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm I'm old. I'm I'm going to turn 55 next week. So I was. That's not old. I was in college <laughs> in the 80s, and then divesting from South Africa was a big deal. So mm-hmm. I was in school in Boston. I did a lot of work on divestment. Uh, I did a lot of work uh, organizing for a labor union that organized the clerical workers on my campus. Mm-hmm. And then when I graduated college, I was a newspaper reporter for a while back east, and then. Uh, in Compton and in Watts. I did a little news writing for uh, KPFK. Okay. And then I got involved uh, with uh, the person who represented my part of town on the city council in mm-hmm. the 90s. I worked for her and and, uh, and and another council member. And when he was uh, getting sick, 
Uh, he got sick as he was seeking his third term. Mm -hmm. I decided to run. Before that, I had also worked with an organization called the Courage Campaign, mm -hmm. organizing for same-sex marriage okay. around the state. And I had uh, run a, a congressional district for Obama's campaign in 08. So I had done a lot of community organizing still mm -hmm. while working in government. And then when my predecessor, he, he got cancer, uh, he had to not run for a third term. So I stepped in and uh, uh, had a pretty, a fairly easy first race for an yeah, elected official. Yeah, I was going to say, it was a landslide win, right? It, it, yeah, it was like 69% or yeah. something like that. So that was pretty good. What do you attribute that success to in the beginning? And, and, and you mentioned you're very different now than you were then. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, when, when, I, when I got elected in 2013, I had been, you know, I'd been very visible in all the neighborhoods. I had been working for neighborhoods in that district mm -hmm. for, you know, 15, 18 years in some cases. So I knew the people and I knew the issues. And, um, you know, I, I think I was as qualified to step into that role mm -hmm. as anybody. I, I, I told folks in, in government that it was a little like going from being a scrub nurse to a surgeon. Right? Mm. You sort of know the, the deal. Um, and, you know, I was... I was one of the more progressive members of the council. I helped get the minimum wage to fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of work standing up for the hotel workers. Tried to ban fracking, stuff like that. But really, in my second term, I think I, I really shifted mm -hmm. uh, in in a lot of ways, and I think I became uh, a much stronger progressive uh, and much more rooted in using the position I had to try to make real some of the promises of social and racial and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that that is a trajectory that I think kept getting stronger mm -hmm. throughout my second term, which was five and a half years, you know, particularly when the pandemic hit. You know, I immediately, as soon as the pandemic hit, I, I jumped past the public health stuff, figuring, mm -hmm. okay, there's public health that will think about that. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, what about renters? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what about the people who can't go to work tomorrow who are one paycheck away? And so, you know, I dove into those issues. And then when, when George Floyd was murdered and people, you know, uh, uh, the, the Karens of the world were even out carrying signs that, that said Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? My, my feeling was, okay, let's make this real. Mm -hmm. Every time there's been a big push for civil rights in this country, it stalls because there's a white backlash. Mm -hmm. So my thing was, how do we make this real? Mm -hmm. And so I got real serious about uh, uh, changing the priorities in terms of policing and other investments in the city and really pushed on um, trying, working with Marquise Harris Dawson to try to stop uh, cops from pulling people over for being black or brown. Mm. Um, and that's a battle we're still fighting. But those things which, for me, became, I think, the absolute tests of what you need to do in a moment this big, where there's an opportunity to do big things, mm -hmm. in, in, in some ways made me a very different council person for my district, because my district's very white and very mm -hmm. wealthy. And um, while they're somewhat sympathetic to those issues, I don't think those are the issues that drive people. And so I, I think in some ways I went in, in, a, in, a, in a direction that um, uh, wasn't the same focus that people wanted. Yeah, and that's awesome to hear, right? I, w w when I heard you say the signs, right, a lot of folks were really performative during the time of the George Floyd pro protest too. So it's really great to hear that you needed to put to action. Um, versus just carrying the signs, which is activism is really important. Yeah. But we saw off where folks put the black screens on their Instagrams, right? Or put it in their in their bios in social media. But it's like, what's really happening? And it really sounds like you went out there and, and, and worked to attempt to instill change because we know that it's a challenge. It, it, it's, you know, th there's always this backlash. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think uh, P Patrice Collars, I think, re has referred to this as, as, as the great regression, mm -hmm. right? Where... Uh, you know, two years ago, everybody was saying, yeah, we need to stop police abuse. We need to stop racially biased policing. And now, you know, in the race to succeed me, there are candidates who are campaigning on refund the police mm -hmm. and who are saying we need more cops. We need to be tougher on, on, on homelessness. And it's it, there, there's a there's a huge gap between carrying the sign and the really complicated and difficult work of dismantling the, the, the systemic and structural racism. Mm -hmm. And that ain't a pretty process. And, you know, you just 
gotta go through it to keep do pushing it. Yeah. yeah what is what's the biggest cha- biggest challenge so you mentioned the day in the life and so much happens and you've mentioned a lot of the things that you've supported like minimum wage homelessness crisis right what, what what's the biggest challenge you faced in in your work as a council member Oh, man. I mean, there's so many, right? I mean, you... Or the biggest. You I mean, can I mean, name a couple. One, I mean, bureaucracy just moves slowly, mm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just... It takes forever to get government to do anything, and you got to keep kicking, and you got to keep pushing. That That's generally. But then, you know, in in the past couple of years, since the pandemic and, and the murder of George Floyd, I think there's been a moment mm-hmm. where, where more people than ever were aware of what's really structurally wrong. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I felt there was a moment... To do things differently, mm-hmm. to, to really make significant change, to not go back to the yeah. norm, you know, right? like like I, I felt like this was our generation's opportunity to do what the New Deal did, you know, ninety years mm-hmm. ago, and what was frustrating is to see that turned into a series of one-offs or a series of pilot programs or a, a, a series of things that aren't lasting, mm-hmm. and that's been tough. I think in LA a lot. LA likes LA government likes to think of itself as progressive and it, it's not the progressive that, that I understand as progressive. I think it's, it's, it's sort of a, a there's a narrow window of what's acceptable. Mm-hmm. So you can give people some money to help with rent, but you know, we're, we're not going to seize the hotels mm-hmm. to, to try to do it. Uh, you can take some money away from LAPD in one given year, but we're not seriously going to address people being pulled over or stopped because they're 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 black or brown, mm-hmm. um, and and that's been frustrating and disappointing to try to get the real change made. Yeah, because then nothing happens, right? It goes back to normal. Yep. I'm 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 facing that right now too. I just feel like there's so much push to have people take care of themselves, or we took care of you and you worked from home, and then now everything's just like oh, back to nine to five. Like, yeah, it's a I mean, slow we're, return we're, for me. I'm like, listen, I used to do my laundry on my lunch break. Who's going to do that now? <laughs> like, what's going to happen? But my, my husband was just saying that today. We took a, a little walk today, and, and he said it's, it's this shock to go from, you know, absolute uh, 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 COVID era yeah. to all of a sudden we're all expected to be back doing something different. And, and the back and forth of it, too, because of those small moments where we felt like things were getting a little bit better, and then the variants coming, right? Yep. And it, it was just, it's trauma. I can't wait to, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not a researcher, but I can't wait to read research on the effects that it's had on us as I'm living it, if that's weird to say. Uh, totally. Yeah. I, I mean, I think everybody has been affected. Like, I've talked a lot since my announcement that I'm not running about mm. mental health issues, but Everybody has had, I think, some mental health consequence as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, there there are people who are really social extroverts who had no outlet for that, mm-hmm. and then there are people I, I, who are... I attended many a happy hours and, <laughs> and turned well, up. And then there's people who are introverts <laughs> like me, and we're like, "What? I got to go back outside again?" <laughs> and then you get like kids like my son. I mean, you know, very important years developmentally where they weren't allowed to be playing with their peers and they weren't learning certain things. Um, And, you know, I I think of the the people who um, who are are now being protected Mm -hmm. somewhat by some of the renter protections we've put in. And now every time we discuss the state of emergency, I've got a couple colleagues who are like, we've got to repeal this. We've got to repeal this. We've got to pull back the renter protections. And I'm like, why? You know, I mean, 50, more than 50% of the people in Los Angeles are tenants, are renters. Mm-hmm. So why would an elected representative feel like there's a rush to, to undo renter protections? Mm-hmm. Some things are going to go backwards to the way they were, I'm sure. But we can't we can't go back to where we were, right? Mm-hmm. It's we like should, we're taking two steps back yeah. and then we take eight steps, you know, yeah. like, or two steps forward and eight steps back, it, yeah. I mean, we should be asking if if the state of emergency is going to end and that means our eviction moratorium expires in a year, mm-hmm. we should be looking really hard at how can we build in more renter protections than we had mm-hmm. before the pandemic. 
That yeah. I think is what we should. As be opposed doing. to just making it go back. Yeah. I feel the same way about uh, student loans. I haven't been paying them, and and what's been going wrong? Everything's yeah. okay. We're not. What, what, you missing my money that hard? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's a lot. It's so many layers of everything that everyone's experiencing. I wanted to get into your decision to not seek re-election. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Sure. Um, I did watch the video that you put out, um, and it was very heartfelt, and I learned a lot about you and mm -hmm. your leadership. I think in that video and sharing that you're really taking a step back to be there for your family. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share a little bit about that here? What, what, what are your yeah feelings? I mean you know it's usually assumed if you hold elective office that you're just going to run again no matter mm -hmm. what until until you kill over or they throw you out mm -hmm. and I actually thought five years ago very seriously do I want to do a second term yeah. things I liked about it things I didn't like about it and because I had this recall attempt against me which I had to defend against mm -hmm. I never had an opportunity to really sit down and think seriously, do I want to run again? And, you know, there were certainly thoughts for, thoughts against in my head. But then when the recall failed, hallelujah, right. uh, then I actually had some time to actually think, what's best for me and what's best for my family? And, um, you know, as I said in, in my video, you know, I've been open about being an alcoholic. I've, I've, I've been open uh, about, you know, experiencing... Uh, being unhoused mm -hmm. and, and, and housing insecurity. But I hadn't talked a lot about mental health issues. And really, since my, when my sister died about 11 years ago, mm. that, sorry. thank you, um, that really threw me deep, deep into a, like an almost catatonic zombie mm. depression for like a year. And this job helped me come out of it in some ways. The campaign gave me a life, you know, a life energy. But, you know, this job is draining and so much of my time is spent focusing on preventing the negative instead of building the positive mm. that I just haven't been, I haven't been happy and I haven't been a great person to be around. So for me, the best decision for me and for my family was to try to take the energy I have and find other ways to channel it into the things I care about. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to stay engaged in the same issues. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll see me at demonstrations. Nothing's I'll, changing I'll, in that way. <laughs> you know, it's just, it'll be expressed a different way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was a really big deal for me is, is my son's age. You know, he's eight. So for the past two years, because of the pandemic, I've been home almost every night for dinner and bedtime. Mm. Right? And if I were to run again as we come out of the pandemic and then serve another four years, that means the next five years is me not home for dinner yeah. and bedtime. And eight plus five is 13. When he's 13, he ain't going to want to hang out with me like yeah. he does now. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to blow that opportunity. Miss those years. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate you bringing mental health into it. Cause that's super important. I I'm always very open about being, loud about my therapy yep. right it, it happened in the very recent years where i would tell i work with students right like oh i have an appointment you know and it's none of your business yeah and then it turned into oh i just came back from therapy a staff meetings and starting out my check-in with i just got off from therapy and it's great and it was a little bit of a shift and i got some criticism or i feel like some judgment and like why are you telling people right and now i'm just like yo you don't got a therapist you know like if you're, you're not in the club like what's going on so i really appreciate that i wanted to ask you who are you when you're your best self like, so you mentioned your son and being home for, for dinner and bedtime, but aside from those factors and, and you as an individual, who are you when, when you feel the best? There's, there's a couple times when I feel my best. When I'm being uh, an engaged father and husband, mm -hmm. that's really date night. when I'm Talk to us about these date dates. Night. Where y'all go? Where y'all going? Every Friday night is date night. <laughs> okay. Uh, we love consistency. Al almost every Friday night is date night. And Saturday night is, is family movie night. Yes. Uh, so th that is really when I'm my best, particularly when I'm playing with my son. Like yeah. That, the joy mm -hmm. and play that an eight-year-old brings. And um, uh, when I have time for meditation or hiking uh, and I can get in touch with the spirit inside mm -hmm. there, there, there there's a lightness and there's a joy i la last october i did something um it's called the hoffman process oh, and um it's 
it, it's a week long retreat. You're shut off from everybody, and it's it's like a year's worth of like psychotherapy in eight days, and it really gets you to examine the patterns in your life Mm -hmm. um, that you keep falling into because you learn patterns when you're young and they're comfortable. So you keep repeating them. And through a series of of what feels at the time, like very weird exercises, verbal, physical, uh, all sorts of stuff, you, you sort of try to rewire your patterns Mm -hmm. and uh, in In eight days, in eight days. Yeah. Lord, I've been rewiring my brain pattern, but it's been taking years. It's taking years. It's a fascinating process because it gets you to think about the different aspects of yourself. What, Mm. what, what, What do you need and crave physically? What do you need and crave intellectually? What do you need and crave emotionally? And what do you need and crave spiritually? Mm-hmm. And 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 th- and it makes you intentional every day about what do these four aspects of myself really need to feel good. Mm. Um, and um, if you get serious about it and you listen to what your 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 these different aspects of yourself are telling you, you need, you 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 try to fulfill them. Because otherwise, I mean, if somebody asked you every day, "How are you feeling? What do you need?" Mm-hmm. And then they ignored you and didn't do any of it. You're like, what the fuck? That's a huge problem. So it's about finding ways to sort of uh, uh, give yourself what you need to feel whole. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, I barely hiked in my life until last October. And now I hike like three or four times a week. That's awesome. it gives me that connection. That's really, really great. Listen, you're not seeking re-election. Do you have a word to say to your haters? Anything you want to say right now? What's going on? What do you want to tell them? (laughs) Now that you know you're a little bit more free, you're, you're, you're basking in this joy for yourself. Well, I, 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 I guess, you know, they, they say that living well is the best revenge. I'm ha- as happy as I can remember being right now. Uh, I thought I might have some remorse or regret mm-hmm. after I made my decision, and I haven't. Uh, I felt light, and I felt free, and I felt inspired, and I'm looking forward to creating the, the, the next chapter. Um, and I'm going to make the most of, I think I've got nine months today mm-hmm. uh, until the end of my term. I'm going to make the most to, you know, uh, try to house as many people as possible, to try to fight for what's right. And uh, then on December 11th or whatever it is, I'm going to spend probably most of the day uh, just blocking some sons of bitches on Twitter. Yes, <laughs> we love that. Oh, yeah. It's gonna be, it'll, it'll be a long day. You know, what I was going to say, you're going to spend your day at Disneyland. Where are you exactly. going? But no, Twitter, not, block. Well, I've got not just like the, the, the folks who were behind the recall, mm. um, but I've got like conservative talk radio like john and ken they've got people from like virginia and texas throwing shit at stay me in your Facebook lane baby stay in your lane it's just it's 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 uh it's kind of crazy it's toxic so, yeah, but it's, it yeah. looks like you're you've done yeah. a good job of just being like mm, and i'm gonna block them so that's awesome yeah. well one thing i would say to them though because th- there's, there's so much bullshit out there I'm getting right? too excited i mean, I mean <laughs> some of, some of the criticism against me i get right mm-hmm. you know, sometimes i make mistakes yeah. sometimes sometimes i do the right thing and i might do it the wrong way i, mm-hmm. I get accountability is important yeah. mm-hmm you know, and I think I've become more progressive because I've listened to criticism from progressives, mm-hmm. uh, and I've tried to to be better. But um, there, there's an element of the criticism against me, and an element of behind a lot of the candidates to succeed me, that is remarkably hypocritical. Mm. The people who are yelling most about encampments which is something to be upset about, are the people who are blocking the homeless housing and the homeless shelter. No matter what solution it is, they come out and they oppose it. They sue to stop it or they appeal it. And um, that's just that's just disingenuous. Yeah, it's like, and, well, then what are we doing? Yeah. Then what are we doing? The, the other thing that's happening out there is um, there is the, the right wing is using homelessness and crime as a way to get people who otherwise identify as progressive to vote for a conservative agenda. Mm. Uh, Sheriff Villanueva is like the, the, the greatest example of that. He is spending all his time, like in Venice, trying mm-hmm. to get people who, you know, Bernie voters to, to, to vote for hate and criminalization. And The fact uh, that, uh, that homelessness is synonymous with crime is so upsetting to me, too. When we think about, like, the root causes of why folks are houseless, even when it comes yep. to things like addiction and all that, right? Or all of these, um, I, I've been, I've been, we report a lot on, on the burglaries that happen for folks when they're 
they're followed by houses folks into yep. their homes. A lot of that also is connected to mental health. Yeah. Right? But it's like, yep. how do we scare people into thinking it's crime and they're all criminals and it's so frustrating. Well, one of the things that, that drives me freaking nuts is the way the news media covers crime. Mm-hmm. If somebody who is unhoused commits a crime, the headline is homeless person does this. Right. I have never in my life seen a headline that says housed person did this. Right. Right. Most crime in Los Angeles is committed by people who live in homes, mm-hmm. but we don't. We we we, we use homelessness as a as, weapon, as as as, as a weapon, and mm-hmm. as a way of saying this defines the class. And yeah. It's, it, it's absolutely wrong. <sighs> it's too much. Um, I want to ask. I want to go back to you sharing. There's so many questions that I have for you, and sure. and I'm learning so much and really enjoying this conversation. But where did your commitment to Los Angeles come from? Given that you're also from the East Coast, I was curious about this because before doing my research, I was like, oh, he's a LA diehard, been here, and you have been here, and you have been committed. So I'm curious yeah. where it stems from. You talked about KPFK. Yeah, I. Uh... You know, when I grew up, I grew up in Massachusetts, right? And so you think of Los Angeles as this flaky place mm-hmm. with, you know, you, you think of Malibu and you think of plastic surgery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's this image the nation has of, of Los Angeles, which is completely false. Mm-hmm. So I never, ever thought I was going to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. Never. You, you thought those things. You oh, believed yeah, them. Sure. Yeah. And after I graduated college, one of my best friends... His dad said, all right, you graduated college. We ain't living here. And he gave him a one-way ticket and said, go out and visit your sister in California. He moved to L.A. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing in Los Angeles? Yeah. And I got, I got sort of restless when I turned 25. And I decided I didn't want to live my whole life a half hour from where I grew up. Mm-hmm. So I, I spent three months. I sold everything I owned. And I spent three months traveling cross country on a Greyhound bus. Wow. Uh, just stopping in different cities and seeing the country. And I ran out of money and and continent here in L.A. <laughs> wow. And I thought I'd stay for, you know, maybe a couple months. And, I, you know, I, I got here in late 91, right? So I got here, you know, there were mudslides, there were fires. I got here uh, right before the, 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 the Rodney King verdict. Mm. Uh, I got here, you know, two years, two and a half years before uh, the, um, the Northridge earthquake. I ruined my parents' like, like wedding, all, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, so all this shit was yeah. happening, right? And in one way, you can say, oh, my God, this is like Armageddon. Mm-hmm. Why would I want to live here? But what I saw really, really inspired me, right? I saw this city that was um, sort of a demographic snapshot of what the rest of the country was going to look mm-hmm. like, that was uh, diverse, that was multicultural, that was grappling with issues and was trying to to build something better. And I, it really inspired me. I felt like, okay, this is, this is where the future is going to get built. Um, I loved that in this city, I mean, you don't have, you don't have to travel outside the country to see the world. You yeah. can, you can go here and you can see art and you can eat food and you can experience every the culture. Beach, in the the mountains. Yeah. You, you get everything here. And, um, I, I, I sort of fell in love. It was really a, a a, a real strong sense of inspiration mm-hmm. that pulled me here. And it's the same inspiration, I should say, the same sense, the same pull I feel when I'm getting cynical about politics or I'm feeling defeated when I see the young activists in Los Angeles, mm. when I see the, you know, the, the 17-year-olds at a Sunrise Movement event or an Extinction Rebellion When you event. see that people give a fuck. Yeah. yeah. When, when you see who turns out, the, the young generation that turns out at, at BLM demonstrations, right, it, or, or, or gun control stuff, it's people who are, th- th- this generation coming up now is creative and imaginative and and appropriately impatient, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. saying, no, 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 you ain't going to fix this in 30 years. You've got to fix this now, yeah. now. And that just, that's so encouraging. It's really inspiring. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Let's get into the fun. We're talking about the youth and creativity. Do you TikTok? Are you planning on TikToking now that you're not seeking re-election? <laughs> What's going on with that? <laughs> if my son will teach me, um, there's uh, there's a couple hot guys uh, from Instagram that I have followed their TikTok accounts yes. to, to see more. You know, it's... I'm learning myself too. I'm like I'm trying to figure out how to edit. I'm like half these half the youth is out here putting on productions yep. on TikTok. There's there's this guy uh, on Instagram. Uh, he goes by the, the handle Masked. Mateo. Masked Mateo. And he, Gotta look him up. he, he does, he, he dresses up as like superheroes. Spider Man and Nightwing, Batman's grown up sidekick, mm-hmm. are his signature ones. And um, 
he's he's really hot and he looks really great in a in a superhero outfit. <laughs> and um, he also has a TikTok channel. So I think that, and I think Ground Game LA was doing a TikTok show for a while, or maybe okay. that was Twitch. Oh yeah, Twitch I, is another one. I'm, you see, and I'm not even up on I'm, Twitch. I'm old. So that's it's not... hard to. <laughs> You know, <laughs> which one it's on. I, I do Twitter and IG and Facebook and I'll, I'll, I'll see. You'll dabble now yeah. that you have more time in the TikTok. Exactly. Yep. We got to get into food in Los Angeles. Yeah. What's your favorite food in your district? Doesn't okay. have to be a taco, but you know, we're fans of tacos at LA Taco. So, um, I, I, I am really, my husband says I'm really annoying to, to, to live with. Well, he, he says I'm annoying <laughs> to live with for a number of reasons. But one of them is he can never tell how I'm going to be eating because I change what I eat constantly mm-hmm. and then I am religious about it. And you can't get me off it until I wake up and I suddenly switch. <laughs> so for lots of period of time, you know, I've been nothing but meat. And then other periods of time I've been uh, raw food only. Mm. Uh, and... I was a, a raw vegan for a number of years. I wow. still go back periodically. But one of my favorite foods is um, raw Oaxacan vegan food uh, from this guy, Sergio Nicholas, uh, from Oaxaca, who has a booth at the Mar Vista Farmer's Market on Sundays. And he has stuff at some health food stores around L.A. and other farmer's markets. And I usually get stuff from Sergio every week. He makes... Um, uh, you know, a, a raw taco, raw enchilada. He what is it made pizza. with? Like, what's your favorite? <clears throat> My favorite, even though it's <laughs> it's funny, it's raw vegan Oaxacan, and he makes a crepe, and it's a it's a breakfast crepe, and it's all fruit, and the you know the crepe shell is made with. Uh, you know, nuts and stuff like that. Wow. And, and, and it's delicious. I eat it almost every morning. I need to look and, that up. Listen, that yeah. sounds healthy too, but it, tasty. It is. It okay. is. So, yeah, I mean, I like supporting small vendors like that. And so I'm a big fan. Uh, Sergio Nicholas, Ra Oaxaca. I think you can find him out on social media. That's so yeah. awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Well, Mike, our time has come to an end. It's been such a pleasure talking to Same you. Same here. I'm still a fan. I'm yep. going to continue to follow um, everything that you do, all the great work you're going to continue to do. Nice. We just heard about the share. Uh, we got the press release for the share yeah. program. Did you want to talk a little bit about that before we close out? Yes, I want to talk about two things before we yeah, close yeah, yeah. out. One is I'll talk about the share thing, and then I want to give a plug. Yes. Uh, the share thing is I've been advocating for a long time for for any possible way to get people off the streets mm-hmm. in a way that works for them. And one way that is quick that I've discovered in, in my part of town is shared housing, where people actually uh, live together as roommates. In community. Some seniors prefer that instead of feeling isolated. Some young people prefer that group mm-hmm. setting. Um, and people who are living together in an encampment in a community may want to live together. And so share gets people off the streets pretty quickly. So I just gave, or I'm in the process of giving them a half million to try to get a hundred people off the streets quickly. Yes. Um, we need more housing of all sorts. People think you know this is a drug problem. People think this is a mental health problem. That's what they keep telling me. Mm-hmm. It's a crime problem. If somebody gets sober, which is really hard to do without mm-hmm. a roof over your head, they're still homeless unless they have a roof over their head. Mm-hmm. So housing is part of every solution to homelessness. Second thing I wanted to, to plug is, um, thank you for letting me be here today. Of course. Is about a year ago, I started doing, on my own, no government money at all, uh, a podcast, What's Next Los Angeles. Yes. I am sometime this spring going to be bringing it back. Okay. And um, it is still available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for the old episodes. It'll be there again once I start What's launching. Next LA. What's Next Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Okay. Yep. Yes. And, we love uh, that. I would love to have you on someday. Oh, please send the invite. I'm there. Awesome. I'm there like Yogi Bear. We Very love it. Very cool. Awesome. <laughs> also, I just want to say, people at LA Taco are fans of your swag. <laughs> your signature look is this fedora. I want to tell us a little bit about that. I'm like, I don't want to end with you. It's so much fun. <laughs> so the, the well, the hat doesn't fit over a little the, bit hard, the, yeah. The headphones. It uh, so I'm from the East Coast, okay. and uh, this is sort of an Irish style hat from 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 back east. Back east, we call it a scally cap. Scally cap. Uh, but um, my father-in-law was. Uh, I said fedora. I'm way off yeah, of my fashion. It, it, Don't it, come it, for me. It, it definitely in a fedora. <laughs> no. Uh, some people call it a newsboy cap. Some people call it um, a, a longshoreman's cap. My my father-in-law, who passed away a couple of years ago, was a real hardcore progressive. He was the international president of the Longshoremen's Union, Mm -hmm. which is a pretty lefty union to begin with. He wore a hat like this all the time. Mm. And uh, when when he passed away a couple years ago on his on his deathbed, um, he was you know saying goodbye to everybody, and he didn't have a lot of strength left Mm -hmm. by the time I got there. He just gave me this. He gave me the 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 fist in the air, Uh. and that actually has 
pushed me in the direction I've gone politically as well. I felt mm. like I was inheriting Dave's commitment to doing the real hard work of social justice. And so the hat is, one, they're comfortable, uh, and it's part of my East Coast thing, but it's also a tribute to, to Dave as well. Oh, to Dave. Thank yeah. you for sharing yeah. that. Well, thank you sure. so much, Mike Bonin. Thank you. We'll, we're continuing to follow all the great work that you do. Folks, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with our next guest. I thought it was amazing. I'm like a chalk. It's so simple. I've done some weird stuff in my life. <laughs> Definitely a spirit. We're here in Tijuana. I'm going to take them to some pretty out of the way spots. Super juicy and savory. Not the tourist stuff. Uh, taco safari. Eat some bomb ass tacos. Doesn't even have a sign on it. It's a $600 trouble right there. I think I love it. This should be illegal. Sin palabras. It's delicious and I will definitely come back. Tacos La Güera. We're going to Tacos La Güera. They're, they're famous for their chile relleno tacos. They should stuff pepper tacos. Uh, it's somebody's backyard. It doesn't even have a sign on it. You just basically, you, you walk till you see a blue tarp in front of a house and a bunch of people standing around it. That's, that's, that's how you find it. It's in La Libertad uh, area. How'd you find it? I grew up around there. You know, I grew up around there and, uh, you know, uh, always look for uh, street dogs and crowds outside of places, you know, that they usually mean there's good tacos around, right? Well, on that note, a feature that I want to write one day is like do a deep investigative dive on the origins of, of using perros for okay, tacos. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, so when I worked in, uh, when I worked for the government, you know, I got to see and know about a lot of weird, weird, weird shit that happened here in Tijuana and all, all over Baja and uh, some of the border cities on the, on, on the Mexican side. Um, some of those rumors are true. It's usually, usually tacos de perro or the dog tacos were something you would, you would, uh, you, you, you would hear about. Like, it, it, it's not a myth, it's true. Usually with stewed meat though, like places that sell birria are, fa are infamous. Some places that sell birria, you know, were later found out to have, be selling, you know, meat, uh, dog meat tacos, you know. Um, and interestingly enough as well, a lot of the a lot of the confirmed cases that actually led to arrest and stuff like that were not tacos they were chinese food uh -huh. baja yeah. has a lot of chinese food places it's like a very popular thing here um probably and this is something i i'll, I'll issue a you know challenge for people that go out there uh in the state of baja mexicali has probably the best chinese food in the world but with some of the best food, there's also some of the shitty food as well. So here in Tijuana, there's a few Chinese places that were actually busted for for uh, selling uh, dog meat and uh, pigeon meat in some of their dishes. Hola, hola, buenas tardes. Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? Soy Taco de la Güera. Aquí estamos para servirles. Es en la libertad y los atendemos con todo gusto. Aquí estamos. Lo piden a veces chile, carne y chorizo, que le llamamos canadiense porque uno de Canadá eh, a eso venía. ¿Cómo se llaman aquí los tacos? La güera. ¿Y por qué se llaman tacos la güera? ¿Por qué será? Entonces, así se quedó por ustedes, por los clientes. So we got the Alba White Truck. Una trufa blanca, White Truffle. God. Yeah, how much is something like that worth? Right now, five, six hundred. That's a six hundred dollar trouble right there. <laughs> right, being about to be put on some chile relleno. Just a little bit on that tripa. Yeah, some white truffle on tripa. The truffle is like a. I think weirdly works with the funk of the tortilla. Yeah. yeah. Tortilla is like you know, I made one. Give your hands something like corn. Corn is a really deep flavor, so it's trouble. And do you think this, is, this has, ever did, has ever been done before? I've done some weird stuff in my life, and this is, a, this is an experience. This should be illegal. <laughs> that was amazing. I'm like, I'm like, it's like, it's so simple. Gracias, eh, for the Oh, 
wow what an amazing interview with mike bonin shout out to him but y'all we're back from break with a viosa the viosa de los angeles herself <laughs> viosa fam hey. what is up i was just telling viosa you smell amazing what are you wearing i'm wearing uh east saint laurent oh i need to do better because i stay buying the <laughs> zara perfumes that are 25 dollars for Those the big ass bottles too. you know for a little spritz yes but thank you for bringing this energy and this uh you know libra aesthetic of course yes. to this space how are you doing today i'm doing good i'm happy to be here you're good i'm so happy to have you we know diosa's busy because we have a podcast party i say we like i mean i'm hosting you're it you're hosting but girl listen you're i'm ready and it. i'm excited <laughs> are you ready for it i'm ready I don't have my outfit, y'all. I fucked up. Do we know how bad Diosa and Mala look at everything that they do? And I'm over here waiting last minute. I'm about to be looking like a little thumb at uh Don't worry, girl, because I don't have my outfit yet either. See, I feel like it's this could be a little together. bit of a Libra category, probably. Libra a move, right? Most likely. But we're probably both going to look bomb. Absolutely. I'm manifesting it. <laughs> let's hope. So let's get into you. Let's get... I want to know everything, Diosa. I feel like right now we just mentioned that this is our first time meeting. I can't believe it. Which is a trip because I just feel like through social media... Yeah. I Te conozco. Like, yeah, and we have that Libra thing. Yeah. We just like. The I want to be a runner. You are a runner. We got the whole thing. The nails, yes. Can we talk about these? We don't have the nail camera right now, but these nails are everything. At Locatora, we call the nail cam Unia Vision. Unia motherfucking vision. <laughs> okay, because you know we got to stay popping in that way. When I get my nails done, I feel like a brand new person. Yes. My friend who gets his like um, haircut, he's like, oh, is this what you feel like when you like get your nails done? I'm like, fuck yeah. I feel Absolutely. like a new ass bitch. Like nothing can stop <laughs> brand me. Brand new. Right. These claws mm-hmm. are everything. <laughs> so let's get into you what's been yeah. going on what's new there's so many projects happening in your life right now i do want to start off with which neighborhood you're repping because we're gonna get into food a little bit later yeah. but where are you repping uh i'm you know born and raised la grew up in southeast la but i feel like i'm just everywhere you know like my pareja li- lives in wilmington so i'm in the south bay a lot okay we go out to eat a lot in the south bay i love that um and you know live in southeast and i'm just around and we recorded in uh, locatora recorded in boyle heights for so many years yeah that, you know, espacio, I, right? I, have a, I have a special love for boyle heights as well you're everywhere you're repping everywhere yes. we love that okay let's get into locatora and your journey and becoming a podcastera peligrosa <laughs> y'all are about to celebrate your five-year anniversary yeah. what does that feel like yeah five years six seasons um, uh, we're doing it. Um, it feels amazing, you know, to have the longevity, to have the stamina. It's not easy for indie podcasters, indie creators. I, I don't have the stamina from week to week. I'm freaking <laughs> out, making sure that we're putting out good things. And you are yeah. out here killing it. Yeah, what, thank you. In what ways do you think you've grown in these five years and six seasons from oh, starting to now? You know, I think really like owning what we do and naming it. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't until 2020 uh, that we really started calling ourselves a production house. Um, Which is wild to me because I feel like y'all been doing it. Right. And we were doing it. And, you know, the pandemic allowed us to step back and really look at what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And, oh, wait, we we write our scripts. We produce it. You know, up until the pandemic, I was editing all of it. Mala was running the soundboard. And so we were very much operating, doing everything. And it's a whole ass production. I don't think people realize that. They think it's just a couple of mics and, you know, a good time. It's like, no. And everything you all write about feels like a production. It feels like you're listening. Like you say, a radiophonic novella, right? (laughs) Exactly. Like I'm following. (laughs) Following along with everything y'all are, you're painting a picture of. So props to you all. Thank you. What has been your biggest lesson in in learning and in building this, Mm -hmm. this, what do I want to call it? I'm I'm missing out on the word. This empire of podcasting. Yeah, I would say um, the biggest lesson I've learned is to just stay authentic. Mm. And that that may sound like, I don't know, like pretty basic, but really like when you see so many people, like there's so many amazing podcasts and there's just so many people creating podcasts and the way you differentiate yourself and stand out is by being authentic and by being original and not trying to be anybody else. That's a thousand. I was just talking about that on a podcast I was on. I think she asked me like, why do you think, like, why do you think you're successful? And like for me to, I have to challenge myself and not, Think, thinking less of myself sometimes like i don't really do anything like, I don't really do you anything. do a lot i know and i have you, to remind myself think, yeah <laughs> Ugh, let's get into that a little bit later right but that piece is so important because there's a market out there for everybody if there's a market mm-hmm. out there for joe rogan there's a market <laughs> out there for all of us doing really right. great work right right and i think that the powers that be you want to say that what we do is niche yeah. You know, and they describe it as niche and there's a small audience. But no, like Latinos are actually a part of the gener- the general market at this right. point in the game. Mm-hmm. And so even if it is niche to some, there's still a market for it. Yeah. And there's someone out there looking Absolutely. for all the great work that we're doing. Let's get into some of the things you're doing. So we know Mala, yeah. we had Mala at the beginning of, yes. of when we first started. Oh my gosh, our audio, we were growing, we're getting better. <laughs> um, but you have actually recently started Locas por Libros. Tell us about yeah. that. So I started Locas por Libros last July, July 2021. 
Um, and really just like a love letter to like all the nerdy women, all the nerdy femmes, the really studious people that like love to read. We love that. You know, and um, during the pandemic, I really started reading again and I had lost touch with that part mm -hmm. of myself for many years. And I was a literature major in undergrad. So just, you know, how, had that background already. And then um, decided like when I started posting actually the books that I was reading, mm -hmm. people would message me and they'd want to talk about it because they were reading it too. Ask and so then I thought like, okay, wait, like I also want to talk about the books that I've just read because I'm like so obsessed or I'm enamored. I loved it. I mm -hmm. want to talk about it. Let's discuss it. And so I slowly started seeing like a digital community for like the book people. That's so awesome. The little book nerds. Mm -hmm. And so launched Locas por Libros on Patreon um, and have been reading, you know, we've read uh, since July. So it's been more than a few books now. And we read mainly Latina authors or authors of color. That's so mainly awesome. Mainly women. Yeah. And just really as a way to also support the contemporary authors, the authors that are publishing in real time. And we know that they need our support because mm -hmm. a lot of the times the publishing houses, they may publish them, but they don't always put the marketing dollars behind it. Yeah. And so if we're like all out there rallying our community to buy this book, let's read this book together. Yeah. It shows these publishing houses like, yeah, there is there is a market for this. There's dollars for it. That's so awesome. How do you find time to read? Like, what is oh, your girl. favorite? What's your favorite uh, <laughs> genre? in literature yeah. I was an English major mm -hmm. um, and I feel oh, like we have so much in common we really do yeah. um, and I feel like most of it was white and like European and I'm not gonna like hate on all of it because I did love Victorian poetry and then when we'd get into like that creepy sinister shit right. like sinners in the hands of an angry god a bitch <laughs> if, if it's spooky I'm like I don't care if it's white you know right. I might like it um, but I had one ethnic studies ethnic studies literature ethnic literature course um, and that was it where mm -hmm. we read The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wu right oh right right um, um, and all of those works, but I love, I follow, when I follow, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to buy that one. Oh yeah, I'm mm. going to get that one. Oh my gosh, that one looks so good. Even because of the cover. Aesthetics yes. is everything. So if the cover is good, a bitch is going to pick it up and of might course. read a page or two. <laughs> but how do you like find that time? Like, yeah. what do you enjoy? Well, I'll be honest, you know, definitely the to be read, to be read pile is mm. larger than like what I'm currently reading. Yeah. Let's be honest about Some that. Some people read like several books at a time. I can't do that. How the fuck? The I've, characters I'm, are going to intermingle. I'm kind of doing that a little bit. I'm trying to do two books at a time, mm. but it's also not my favorite. Um, but honestly, just reading 30 minutes before bed, like it yeah. adds up. And, and it's also better for you because you're not on yes, your phone. Yes, if you're really serious. And for me, like, I'm someone, I sleep with my phone, mm -hmm. you know, or like, I need something to fall asleep watching. Yeah, right? I watch Gilmore Girls. But it's actually, it's right. It's yeah. also, yes, also love Gilmore Girls. <laughs> but it's really, wow. it's really bad for your REM cycle, yeah. right? And everyone's like, you know, don't sleep with your phone. You got to disconnect. Yeah. So if you give yourself that task, you know, of like, let me read 30 minutes before bed. Like, yeah. it gets you in the mood to sleep. That's like, true. you know, you start to unwind. Um, unless the book is really good, then you're going to stay up all night. Yeah. It, and know? then that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. It's like watch TV, read a book. Right. It's a good balance. Yeah. What's your favorite literature? Like, what are you currently reading? Oh, I'm currently reading. And it's okay if you're not because, you know, you're busy. No, no. I'm currently reading. I'm blanking on the name. Oh, my God. Um, well, I just finished reading, actually, for Locas por Libros. Okay. Um, Fiona and Jane by okay. Jean Chen Ho. Um, and I'm really excited to discuss that book. It's a book about two friends, two mm. uh two Asian American women um, that gr grow up and they have their their trials that they go through and mm. kind of lose each other as friends and then they reconnect and basically like everything they've learned since they've been away. Oh, it's a awesome. really beautiful story. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Let's get into friendship. <laughs> okay. What do you think makes a good friend? The pandemic, the Panini Press, whatever the fuck we're in is still kind of happening. I feel like some people are right. still wearing masks and all mm -hmm. that. What was that experience like for you as you navigated that? Like yeah. Locas por Libros was born, Locas right? During Libros the pandemic. So much. So much. Locatora Productions was as a, as a production house was born during mm -hmm. the pandemic as well. Um, wow, what makes a good friend? Um, I think just someone that is caring, you know, and like checks in. Mm -hmm. And I know that folks have like their own stuff that they go through. So I don't necessarily mean like you got to be available all the time, yeah. you know, but folks that like want to know how you're doing and yeah. vice versa. I think having that reciprocity is really important in any friendship. Yeah, that's genuine. Yeah. I literally don't even have that written down. But as you talked about that, I just thought about like the beautiful community people you surround yourself with. Like yeah. I saw you posted on your birthday being someone with your homies. And yeah. 
I, I recently hosted an event at my place of um, employment. I usually don't <laughs> like shouting it out too much. Um, where we talked about toxic love and relationships. Right. But we didn't, like, in the conversation, the students themselves, in my head, I wanted to, like, shift towards talking about friendships because we don't talk about that enough. Right. Um, but the students did it themselves, right? And they were talking about so much that happens in our lives and boundary setting and you just reminded me of that. So I got on a tangent and what I, what I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, you know, you have to have boundaries with your friends too. And I yeah. think something I've learned over the years is like sometimes you're going through something, but it doesn't mean your friend has that like capacity. Mm. Or like they're literally at work right now and like yeah. they don't have time to hold space for you. And so literally being like, hey, like, can we chat? Can we check in about this? Can we talk about this? Yeah. And they're like, yes or no. Yeah. And, and like, like that boundary is important. It's so important, especially during the pandemic. I feel like I gave everybody so much access because mm. I wasn't doing a lot. It's right. like, and because I was, I was craving that connection. And then I learned it during the, the pandemic too, that I had to check in with people because our mental health was suffering so much. Right. Like we're already so bombarded with trauma porn on Instagram, on social media, on TV, mm -hmm. everywhere. Something fucked up is happening. People are dying. Right. Um, that I learned to practice like oh do you have capacity to talk about this right now right or like maybe starting off with like blah, 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 something happened and then being like wait my bad like <laughs> how are you how are you today before right. I throw up all my bullshit on you right yeah so I want to read that book real. now yes yeah. you should it's good there's some like you know queer themes mm. like romance dating like trying to get your that. shit together being a mess yeah. like you know like life like life yeah real shit that's awesome let's get into dating and love and life with oh, you okay. we're libras i know you got your pareja yes what's it like for you to be in a relationship or even when you were dating before i don't right. know what your date i love talking about <laughs> dating i'm like we need to talk about dating if let's the is on the show it. yes let's do it what, what what's your relationship like what do you look for in a partner yeah oh my god okay well let's see um well i've been with my with my partner for four years now oh so it's been a while it's been a while i don't know why i thought it was recent no I'm tripping. no yeah it's been four years so you know i've been out of the dating game for a while <laughs> you're like it's been a minute girl i'm like what is that like now <laughs> um yeah but you know we've been together for four years and so i'd say for a partner like i look for someone that's um you know kind mm -hmm. and like gonna like take care of me in, in whatever capacity that means. And what you need, and yeah. And what I need, right? And it's also, like, really supportive and not a celoso. Like, mm. we don't have time for jealousy. Like, we're on Instagram in lingerie sometimes. We're right. on Instagram, you know, doing doing the, the, the things for the art, yeah. right? The production. And there's no time for any, like, jealousy. Or so, policing, or right? Policing or of, control. None of that. None mm -mm. of that. Um, and this is like my first real relationship with a man, you know, so mm -hmm. I like identify as bisexual um, and all my serious partners have been women. And so this is like we've been navigating that, you know, for four years. Yeah. Of, you know, kind of just like, all right, what's it like to be with a man like for real? How and is navigating? Okay, we need to get into that. How has <laughs> navigating that been like? Because yeah. sometimes when I read things, I'm just like, there's so much. When I really look introspectively at like what it means to be in partnership with a human in general. But then when it's you think lot. about toxic masculinity or yeah. things that we're taught as kids, both as women or mm -hmm. uh, male identified people. So what is that navigating that been yeah, like? Yeah, you know, you have to be with someone. If you date men, if you date straight men, mm -hmm. you have to be with someone at least i think that's willing to unpack mm. their own shit mm -hmm. and they have to unpack their own like learned taught toxic masculinity mm -hmm. right because if not like you're gonna spend so much time and labor do, learn, doing that for them yeah and that's too much because we have a lot of our own things that we need to be working on and that's not our job as people right our careers like we don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. So someone who's willing to look within and at least hear feedback, I think, is what I'm hearing you yes. say. Because I, I don't think, I think sometimes I've been judged by family members that say, you're such an elitist. Like, I mm. use the terms that I learned in therapy, and I don't <laughs> never want to weaponize them. But right. I'm like, wow, your anxious attachment is really showing. Like, <laughs> and people are like, the fuck does that Once mean? Once you learn about attachment theory, it's over. Wait, can we talk about that? Because <laughs> I want to... Pub I want to email the publishers that put out the book Attached. I don't know if you read that one I specifically. No. My therapist gave it to me and she's like, listen, the title is cheesy. I think it was like the science to getting and keeping mm. love. And I was like, oh, that is cheesy. Shout out to my therapist. But I was like, girl, yeah. you got me fucked up. <laughs> like, I'm not doing this to keep love. Like, I just don't understand my brain. Right. And and ever since I learned about that, I literally everything I see on TV, I'm like, oop, avoid it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Look at that ambivalence. I'm always like categorizing everybody. So that's so funny. It's really hard navigating, like yeah. having that knowledge and being right. in a relationship with someone who doesn't and then finding that medium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, therapy or not, like, and regardless of gender, like you have to be with someone that's willing to put in the work yeah. to be a better person. Because none of us are perfect. No. And all of us can do things that'll make us better. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Let's get into you. Well, actually, no, really quickly, dating. Like, what do y'all do for dates? Uh, okay. I'm trying to get ideas over here yeah, because I love yeah. seeing all the things that you do. I'm getting yeah. so excited with the mic today and I'm touching it. Yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> trying to, like, actually, I'm in a place now where I've been online for many years mm-hmm. where I'm, like, trying not to be too public about. Mm-hmm. So I, I post less. Yeah. I, I can talk about it, but, like, I post, like, things that we do a lot less. Yeah. I'm um, just trying to be more private with that, mm-hmm. you know. But we, like, we love to eat. Like, we go to restaurants. Yes. We love to go to breweries. We love to, like, want well i like to drink wine and we like to go like wine tasting yes. and go to like wine bars um so yeah we're like up and down long beach all the time okay so long yeah. beach is the scene long beach for us yeah because he's on that side mm-hmm. and so we like we'll go to long beach a lot i love that yeah i was there for valentine's day and i really enjoyed yeah, it i saw it was so much fun yeah. i've never i go to long beach like i used to go to like where hamburger mary's is mm-hmm, and all that mm-hmm. area but we went to support El Barrio Cantina, mm-hmm. and I was like, wait, there's so many cute places here there to are. support. There are so many small businesses, mm-hmm. Latino-owned businesses, yeah. all there's of a, that. There's a really good nightlife there. There is. I love that. You talked about your social media life, and I had a question in here mm-hmm. where I was curious how your social media life differs from your real life, right? So you talk, yeah. want to tell us a little bit more about posting less or what that's like? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's pretty like you get what you see. You know, mm-hmm. I think like what I post online is how I show up in real life, too definitely Mm. um but just for me like you know when you're a woman online like you have to be very careful like i had somebody like call my phone once what how did they get my number i don't know like a a man called my number and he was asking me like he wanted to send me money (laughs) like listen we're never mad at that but how did you get my number sir exactly here's my manual but never call me again (laughs) you know how did you get my number and like he kept saying like you know well i want to send i want to send you money i want to send you money and i of course hung up right because how did you get my number? <laughs> <laughs> that's the most important you know? thing. Yeah, that's not that's not safe. So I, like, remember texting Mala immediately, and I was like, girl, like, can you believe what just happened, you know? And so when you're a woman online, very mm-hmm. much online, like, all the content's online, like, you got to secure your be, – and be safe as possible, mm-hmm. right? And so – yeah, like definitely never posting your location while you're there. You know, I try not to post like my partner and I too much either. Mm-hmm. Just like you just never know what energies are coming your way. Yeah. And so I try to be like, I'm the, I'm here for the for the podcast. I'm here for the book content. Yeah. I'm here for that stuff. And I'll show up and I show up, mm-hmm. right? Um, but just being able to 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 know like what you want to post and what you don't yeah. and just let that be okay making that decision mm-hmm. i need to work on that a little bit because sometimes i'm like <gasps> if i don't post like right. so and so is not going to see it or i'm not going to get this opportunity to like get yeah. this information out there but that's not my responsibility right. right yeah i definitely went through like when i was posting a lot mm-hmm. you know and now i'm i'm a little bit more conservative in the posting yeah I, and I, I saw you tweeted i think recently where you talked about enjoying creating not to monetize Mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that like what is that like yeah so you know i've been running for like consistently mm -hmm. for two years now and um i'm at a point where i'm like running half marathons i just ran one in zion yes i saw that it was amazing yeah and i realized like wait a second this is the first hobby of mine that i've had that i haven't like made content for i'm not trying to monetize it like it's just a hobby yeah it's what you're enjoying and i think the podcast started off literally as a passion project Mm -hmm. or hobby and that's swiftly the universe said hell nah girl we making a business yeah right and um it grew faster than we could keep up with Mm -hmm. it and so naturally we were pushed to like oh we have to be all in this yeah right but you still want to keep some things for yourself. It's mm. just like for fun. And there's no pressure to do it. Right. Nobody is making me run. It's I'm you choosing and you're to holding accountable. It. Yeah. Right. I'm choosing to do it. Um, and same with, with reading. Like there's a little more like, of course, I'm, I'm doing part of it for the book club mm. now. But also being able to keep a little bit of it for myself, which is like reading things that like have nothing to do with the book club. Yeah. And you know? connecting it from your yeah. life aside from Locatora. Yeah. I love that. Um, what is your day job? Like what did you do before podcasting? Girl, well, I still have a day job. Oh, you do too. <laughs> Listen, we're out here. I was about to say, because it is a whole business. Yeah. You know, I'm doing a lot with it. Well, so I just left my job actually um, working in assisted living. Okay. I was doing that for four years. So the majority of the time I've been with the podcast, um, I was working in assisted living. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I just started a job with Revolve Impact. It's a creative agency and I'm like running some of their social media accounts. So I'm full content online now, girl. That's so awesome. What was yeah. that transition? Like how did you get into assisted living mm -hmm. and then transition into social media? I mean, obviously you do social media, so yes. you're amazing at it. Yeah, it was a swift, easy transition because I've been doing it for yeah. the podcast. But in regards to assisted living, I was just like looking for a job. Mm -hmm. um, this opening came up and I just went for it got it it was what i needed at the time mm -hmm. stable nine to five i can go do look at stuff after work benefits. i can go there on the weekend i have my benefits mm -hmm. i have my benefits all that good stuff that you need mm -hmm. because it's really great to like throw yourself into your 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 side hustles or your gigs and all of that but if you're stressed about money yeah like you're never going to show up mm -hmm. your full self you're going to be stressed mm -hmm. and so i kept my day job for as long as possible and even now as we're continuing to grow in like enormous waves, like I still have a day job, yeah. you know, and there's just a lot of responsibility when you're like first gen, you got, you know, you're taking care of your parents, like all those, all those things mm -hmm. that a lot of us experience and are going through. So you keep your day job until yeah. you like absolutely are like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know? I was talking I'm sure to you my, get it. Yeah. I was talking to my therapist about that too. And how we come from generations where it's like, once you secure something that's so stable, mm -hmm. um, for me specifically, I feel like therapy is what keeps me. I don't want to pay $150 a session. I'm like, that's so much. <laughs> <laughs> You're not rich. Um, but yeah, and having conversations with my own parents and my therapist, it's like the generations are so entrenched in that stability. Yeah. And there isn't, I mean, I don't want to say there wasn't creative people, obviously, in their generations. Obviously, there is, but Absolutely. not at the capacity where we're at now. I think the side, I mean, our, our people have been like side hustling for years, yeah. but I think the concept of the side hustle is like a little newer even though they were doing it for yeah. years and years and years and even the way that folks are monetizing off of mm -hmm. things right there's a way only fans is it fat no oh my god i was about to say fans only how embarrassing <laughs> i'm a tia like only fans and folks right. making that a side hustle like i feel like yeah. the side hustles and what they are also shifted from back then back then it's like yeah i paint houses on the side right maybe it's hey i jump on the turntables for five dollars an hour or a gig i don't know <laughs> obviously uh, money was different back then too but um i do feel like it's inspiring to see that so many people are doing it, are holding both side mm -hmm. hustles. And then eventually, do you have plans to do Locatora full time? I do. I do. I mean, I feel like I do it full time already. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, really, truly, like, yes, that definitely like That's a goal. end goal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we got bills to pay. We got, got a lot of responsibility. So for now, you know, the day job and I and I love this the agency that I'm at right now. Yeah. I love it for you. You also have <laughs> talents in writing. You said you you studied uh, literature and yeah. creative writing at UC mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. Yes, I did. Where, do you, where did that passion come from or where has that gone? Do you want to work on that a little bit more too? Yeah, you know, I, I had this idea that I was going to get an um, MFA, like a master's in finance. Yes. That, was the, that was the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm burnt out from school. I don't want to write anymore. And that's actually how the idea for the podcast came. I like still wanted to be creative. There's still so much writing that happens mm -hmm. with the podcast and so I really channeled all of that into the podcast mm. I still like freelance on the side you know I, I've like written for like Fierce by Me Too, Remezcla, Pop Sugar, Hip Latina yeah for a lot of folks yeah and so I, I've done though I've done like the, the Latinx pubs um, for the most part not LA Taco though I know I'm, we need to get I'm you ready. on as a writer I'm right ready, LA Taco <laughs> <laughs> we need to have you on there there's so much I feel like you can contribute to, yeah. to everything that LA Taco I puts have my out. ideas listen one of the topics that I read about <laughs> that you were writing about is sexual health though yeah what does that mean to you because mm -hmm. when I read sexual health so much comes up first yeah. and foremost I feel like I think about like reproductive health right mm -hmm, absolutely um, but what would you say you're passionate about when it comes to that and writing about sexual yeah. health I would say access like okay. and language it's so important especially like in our communities like a lot of us weren't given sex ed mm. talks you know or even like basic sex, sex education in school yeah and so when we're talking about reproductive justice health sexual health like how important is it to know your body it's yeah. extremely important right? and like how shamed it still is i feel right. like when i say anything regarding sex it's still like I'm yes. like, what year are we in? Can we chill and talk about right. penises and vaginas and pleasure? And, and these are basic things. Yeah. Everybody has mm. sexual organs. Everybody is a sexual being. Yeah. And so you have to talk about sexuality, sexual health. Um, and also, like, sexual health and com conversations around sexual health are also a knowledge share. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like, had a... Had a I did, wrote an article about, like, Kotex actually had, like, a class action lawsuit because they're 
tampons, like during a specific time they were manufactured, were like leading to a bunch of like UTIs. What? And like other illnesses. I'm scared. Listen, I'm going to say it on the record. I'm scared <laughs> of tampons. I do not wear tampons. I'm I can't. I don't wear them anymore. Terrified of them. After that, after that, that article that I wrote, I was like, oh no. Like mm -mm. just I. First of all, from being young and like penetration, right. it being you know mm -hmm. that's how I was taught. Obviously, like shout out to my mom, but you know I listen oh, yeah. to my, I listen to Norma for everything. Moms did not allow you to wear tampons at least in Latina households. Yeah, because it meant something else. It meant something else. So, mm -hmm. and I also my mom has been super open. My mom, I feel like I'm raunchy because of her. Like she's <laughs> she was always doing yes. shit that now I think back to and I'm like. You were being a little sucia. Like, you know, so she wasn't in that I way. I love that. But I think for her, it came from her not being taught. Absolutely. And putting it in wrong and then experiencing pain and being mm. like, bitch, who, not, who's going to help you? Not me. And so I'm still, <laughs> as as a 31-year-old woman, I'm still terrified yeah. of them. So now learning, I did read an article once when I was really young, too, that actually someone slept with their pad on. No, no, it was a tampon. It, it was a tampon. And they, like, went into, like, what is it? like Toxic a, shock syndrome. Yeah. Baby, when mm -hmm. I read about that, I also said, let me not be the one because <laughs> I would accidentally fall asleep. Like, there's so much that can happen. Right, right. But how would you know that unless you're talking about it? Yeah. And so that's the point. You have to or have Or unless you have access to these little magazines yes. that I was sneaking around. Right, right. And it so was probably Cosmo, it. but... And a lot, of, a lot of the ways we learn about our se own sexual health and sexuality is with our friends mm -hmm. because we're not having the conversations at home. They have to happen somewhere. Yeah. They're going to happen with your friends most likely. Or but porn. How, how are your friends getting that information? Right. right. I also I was talking about porn with a friend earlier too, and how porn is so centered in male pleasure. Absolutely. Or I should say, like it's not you know like on the pleasure of the person with the penis. Right. The and male it, gaze. The male gaze. The yeah. Male gaze. And it's so frustrating. Like when we think about like all of it is just really pleasing. Absolutely. Women. It's so fr like I hate it. I hate it right, for us. Right. So I also hate it for us. Yeah. I'm like trying to re envision <laughs> what it would look like for it to be better. And I know there's a lot of folks doing great work. There are. Around pleasure, even for mm -hmm. folks who have disabilities, for folks who, yes. you know, for different reasons can experience pleasure the way we're taught in mm -hmm. porn and all of that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I hope to. I hope that becomes more of a topic that's talked about. Yeah, that, I agree. This is an LA Taco piece. Yes. <laughs> sex in Los Angeles. A little let's, sex in the city. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm ready. That would be fun. <laughs> so let's get into you. We talked a little bit about mental yeah. health, but what has that journey been like for you? You know about attachment. What um, are you an <laughs> avid therapy goer? I am an avid therapy goer. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to my white therapist. Okay. I love her. Okay. She's, she's good. She's great. Okay. Yeah. I was a little apprehensive. I'm like, I'm okay, like, honest. oh, tell me about her. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little apprehensive when I... I've been in therapy now for four years. Same. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What year did you start? 2017. Is Girl. that more than four years? No, that's... I think it might be five, oh, but... Oh, five. Wait, is it six? Actually, this is, I think, my therapy anniversary around this time. No, I started in October after a toxic relationship. Yeah, but 2017. Same, actually, yeah. also. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I feel like we're like mini twins. I feel like, yeah. But what have you, what, what has that journey been like oh, for you in man. finding your best mental yeah. health self? You know, I heard you earlier talking about, um, you know, being very open about mm -hmm. it. And I, I've definitely had that same journey when I was starting therapy mm -hmm. of like just saying I'm going to therapy today right yeah and just telling my family there was this one time where i couldn't go to a family function it was a weekday and i had therapy and later my mom was like oh yeah i told everyone you had physical therapy and I, girl for what I what like, bone am i helping this body? i was like physical therapy why and she was like well i didn't know if you wanted everyone to know but i know that it was more her yeah. she didn't want everybody to know that her daughter to be was like in why therapy. is she going to therapy yeah exactly so i like let that one slide but that was like noted and so like being able to be open about it yeah. you know was really it's important. so powerful yeah and you know like you really are modeling that mm -hmm. even for folks that are old even your family members that are older than you that yeah. like maybe have thought about therapy but don't know how um and then in a way like you kind of become this little resource for everybody mm -hmm. which is like good maybe it's a little stressful sometimes but you know it, it gets people talking about really important shit it and really taking does. care of themselves i like really sharing hard. yeah i like sharing what i learn at least nuggets because lord knows it's a whole hour of me like crying and being dragged <laughs> lovingly right. by my therapist uh -huh. Um, but I, I think that's one of the things that I enjoy doing because I always receive so many D DMs saying, wow, I really needed to read this mm. or, yo, I never thought about it like this. Like, thank you for posting. But it really is such a good resource that doesn't work for everybody. But right. I feel like in the way that I receive it, it like helps someone to another capacity. But then it could get exhausting because then yeah. I become that friend that's like, what do you think? What is this? Right. And I love sharing the nuggets, but I'm like, why didn't I study to be a licensed marriage and family therapist? Everybody uh, says that to me. Like, why aren't you, why aren't you getting your 
your your license. Like, right, you people tell that? me that too. Oh my god! <laughs> like, because I'll be at a family function and we'll be having beers and talking about like so and so's outfit, yeah. and then next thing you know, I'm like, wow, did you think about this? And this, and mm-hmm. my cousins are like, bitch, like, why didn't you go into yes. this? And shout out to my cousin Natalie because she actually is a marriage mm-hmm. and family therapist, okay. so she followed that and she teaches me a lot too. So I love that. I love I love therapy for us. And I love therapy for who it works for. Yes, I yeah. think being honest that like therapy is not easy. It's not mm-hmm. easy work. Mm-hmm. Why? Like and it's you're gonna work. cry, you're gonna like it's gonna be a me- you're gonna be a mess for a while. Uncover you're unpacking things. so much, yeah. right? You're uncovering like childhood lifelong trauma. Mm-hmm. One, two, like you might not like your therapist. Yeah, and, and then, it takes time to find one, and that might discourage you. Mm-hmm. And so it makes all the sense. It's also expensive. You know, there's like so yeah. many barriers as to why people don't go to therapy. Yeah. And so I just be gentle with yourself if you're like still trying to figure that out. Yeah. I'm always I'm telling people like go to this agency and if you got Kaiser they take out of pocket. Like I'm over <laughs> here like I already have my calculations cuz yes. yeah, it's too expensive. And even for college students, I feel like on campuses they get like four free sessions or 10 free sessions, right. but it's like you're like barely opening up. Right. And, and then you got to wait a whole month. Bill. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm like over here like <laughs> my students are like tears like but I don't go back until another so and so right. days. I'm like I'm sorry it's a lot but who do you, what is diosa feel like at her best self like oh, how would yeah. you describe yourself as your best self rested 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 <laughs> rested i hydrated. saw y'all tweet to kim kardashian saying girl you right we don't yes. want to work you know we like recently did an episode about like bimbos mm-hmm. like, i loved it yeah listen oh, yeah, I, that's right you yes about i was it. like wait do i have to look into satanism real quick because y'all right. talked about <laughs> We need to challenge these ideas and, and conceptions right. we have of people who are bimbos, right? right? Well, I mean, and to Satanists also, like, you know, we learned about Satanist principles, ideologies last year when we had Prisca Dorcas Mojica Rodriguez on the podcast. I love that you said her name perfectly. We're about to have her at, oh. the, at my place of employment. <laughs> oh, okay. And every time I say her name, I'm like, Prisca Torcas, yeah. like I'm like yeah, I yeah. never it rolled yeah, yeah, off yeah. your tongue. <laughs> yes, so she like shared with us like the the principles of Satanism, mm-hmm. and Mala and I were like, wait a second, like are we Satanists? Like if you look it up, mm-hmm. like it there, you know, it's like good. You're you have to be good. Like you have to be. It's good not person. stereotypical. You yeah, can't judge people. You know, like all these all these things that we probably already practice anyway. Yeah. But in regards to bimbos, right? Yes. Like, you know, there's this like belief that like you know bimbos don't want to give access to everybody, like Mm. all of their knowledge, all of their thoughts. And like, they just want to vibe. Bimbo's just want to vibe. I think that's, we can all get behind that. Yeah. We just want to vibe. We're tired. We're resting. And if you're You're talking shit, I'm not even noticing because I'm so much in my own head that I don't give a fuck. Exactly. Exactly. So tune in. Yes. (laughs) I love, I was busting up and I was actually (laughs) running. Listen, you're inspiring me in all the ways. I love that. I said, let me listen to the episode while I try to be like the Osa, jump on the treadmill (laughs) for 30 minutes. It took me out, but it was cracking me up. Good. Because it really made me really think about bimbos too and how they're portrayed. And we talked, I know y'all talked about Tom and Pammy. No, is it Mm -hmm. Tom? Tom Lee. Girl, I'm Mm -hmm. like, wait, is it Nick? I don't know his name. Um, I feel so fucked up for watching Mm -hmm. it yeah Mm -hmm. because then I listened to you talk about how she didn't give consent for that and the whole show Mm -hmm. was about her being violated I know but she's coming out with her own side of the story like a a production own series she's doing a netflix show okay yeah see i'm gonna support that we're gonna watch that one yeah it's (laughs) fucked up i mean i did finish the other one but it's just like it's it's fine girl it's pop culture yeah especially what we do we like we have to keep up with what's happening yeah yeah okay next question that's fun about yourself what kind of dog mom are you let's talk about your pooches ew that word was so fine your pups your puppies pup sounds better (laughs) um Okay, I think about this all the time. If I'm like, if I really spoil my dog, like, what does that say about me? Like, oh, does that so you, is that gonna think tra- about is that. that gonna translate if I ever decide to have real kids? Mm. Like, am I gonna be that kind of mom? Like, I never thought that I would be, but seeing how I treat my dog, mm-hmm. like. <laughs> You're like, wait, how am I going to treat my child? Yes, he's so spoiled. He gets whatever he wants. What's his name again? Tahin. Tahin. Oh, he's so precious. My Is baby. it a Pomeranian? He's a Pom. I better know your life. I'm over oh, here like, what kind of I love it. I love dogs That's too. why it feels like we've met. Right. We know. Yeah, we, we know. do. We know the things. We know the things. So you do spoil Tahin. Spoil, yeah, spoil dog mom. We love sure. Tahin. I love that you talked about being the neighbor next door who's a dog walker Girl, too. Like, listen, you, you show the so dogs love. Dogs. We have so many Because dogs. they bring us so much joy. Yes. I have, I'm a tia to many of them, but I don't live with my own 
because I feel like I'm not responsible enough yet. <laughs> it's a lot like, of if work. I can't go out because I got to take care of your little yes. ass, then see, that's how, is that the kind of parent I'm going to be? No, I hope not. Maybe not. No, maybe not. <laughs> but like, no, it's true. Like, everyone's like, oh, having a dog is so cute. Uh, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Like, when Tahin wants to get up at five in the morning, you have to who's get out there him? with him making sure a coyote doesn't eat him? Oh, Me. Oh, that's true. So, <laughs> Damn, you know? the dogs are getting got out of here. Yes. Listen, our time right now, I'm over here, like, oh. the producer's like, ask the taco question. Okay. What's your favorite taco in Los Angeles? We got to know that before we go to break. Okay, Al Pastor, Leo's Tacos, my Ooh, favorite. You came ready. Yes. I'm here I thought for about it. it. I thought about it on the drive They're going to ask me. I got I to gotta have an answer. I haven't been to Leo's. It's so good. I can't believe I haven't. It's I feel so like good. it's popping. The fresh piña, mm, delicious. The way they like chop yep. it up from the top, huh? Yep. I've heard that. Yep. I need to try it. My mouth yes. is watering. I'm hungry. Um, Before we go to break, can yes. I just say, oh, please. come to our party. Yes. Lara I, is I needed to end like that too. We don't know what we're wearing yet, but it's going to be fire, okay? Yes. Look what do we have to expect? A podcast party. A the podcast bops. party. DJs. Live comedy. music. Comedy. A little short film. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay. A little mini documentary about we Locatora. We love that. With the, with the hot neighbors next the door. Looks. Or the girls next door. The girls next door. The porcasteras next door. Listen, yes. we love it. I can't <laughs> wait to host. Like I said, I have to come correct. Like if I don't look yes. good, I'm going to never live it down myself. This Sunday at the Resident in the Arts District. Yes. Come through. 2 p.m. 2 to 7. 2 to 7, okay? It's going to be a party. Check it out. Get your tickets. Tickets are available. The links are all over. Go to Locatora Radio, Instagram. I've posted it. <laughs> I'm going to keep posting it. Come through. Thank you so much for Thanks being for with us. Me, My fellow Libra. We're going to take a break <laughs> and we'll be right back. This is a taco fronterizo in the most 100%. Is this like the middle ground between like an American French taco <laughs> and a Tijuana taco? I mean, it could be. Here in Tijuana, I'm gonna take them to some pretty out of the way spots. Super juicy and savory. Not the tourist stuff. Uh, taco safari, eat some bomb ass tacos. Doesn't even have a sign on it. It's a $600 trouble right there. I think I love it. This should be illegal. Sin palabras. It's delicious, and I will definitely come back. So that's El Taco Nazo. If you're a tourist, that's where you go. Yeah. We're not going there, we're going to a seven. If people are taco connoisseurs here, Tacos Frank is a few blocks away. Everybody goes there. It's just more of a local place. There's a weird freedom to Tijuana that is, I think, probably captive and fascinating to people that are not from here, from the U.S., that you know have never experienced that. Work, opportunity, you know, there's a lot of it here. Tijuana. There is a lot of work and a lot of opportunity and not specifically related to going across the border but actually just making a living here. I mean there's a shit ton of opportunity. It's just that it's not people's, it's never people's first choice. Like Tijuana is known for a few things. Culinary tourism, medical tourism. Medical tourism. And Tijuana care. Yeah and also right now like a weird like side quest. A spiritual. Oh really? Tijuana is uh, probably one of the largest epicenters of occultism in Mexico. Uh, outside of Catemaco and Mexico City, I mean, we have voodoo, we have santeria, we have palo mayombe, we have santa muerte, we have uh, you name it. We even have all our own saints. There's a, there's a, a saint called uh, Juan Soldado, which was a soldier that was uh, assigned to a garrison here. He was falsely accused of murdering a, a girl. And he was giving, given the lay fuga, which is a rare military form of justice that is not practiced anymore. Basically, they would make you run, and they would shoot at you, and if you got free and didn't get shot, you're, you're free to go. You're innocent. And he didn't, you know, he didn't run far, basically. And he was buried where he landed, and, uh, in an old cemetery. His, uh, his gravesite has become like a shrine for people. People yeah. that, uh, yeah. So there's a, there, that's a that's a weird side that's of Tijuana old. that uh, hasn't that I've not seen a lot of people talk about. Wow. Is sex tourism still strong here? Yeah. This is the like largest a, one of the largest brothels in North America is right over there. So yeah, sex tourism is like there's a tolerance zone is what they call it. Basically, a place where prostitution is legal. It's like a small little area uh, in uh, Calle Primera, the first street. And of course, it's basically, you know, 
fed from, from American sex tourists, please. Yeah. A key. Yeah. A key. So we're at a, the second to last stop. So what they're known for here at Taco Esteban, uh, New York taco. It's a New York steak. Flat, sliced really thin, salted really well. And on a thicker corn tortilla, lettuce. Not cilantro, not cilantro, not cebolla, but lettuce. Lettuce. May and mayonnaise, and a really spicy green salsa that I'm pretty sure is just like chopped up green chilies. And, and, and a slice of avocado. And a slice of avocado, no, no guacamole. No guacamole, just a slice, a of, slice avocado. of avocado. Slice of avocado on there. Warrior steak, tortilla, avocado. It's, it's, they're pretty fire, they're pretty unique, and they're like a mainstay here. It's been around for years. This is, this is what happens when you do a, a, this is a taco fronterizo in the almost 100% like definition of that. A, a border taco. It's a, it's, a, it's a taco in transit. It's about to get a, put in the back seat in the, in the trunk of a car and, <laughs> and uh, maybe make it to the US. What a great episode so far, y'all. I've enjoyed today's conversation so much, and I'm super excited to now welcome Crisol to the L.A. Taco Show. What up? Oh, you know. Just you, I just gotta say, you're glowing. Am like, I? you walking in here, you literally look like a movie star. Stop that. I'm like, wait, can we talk about our makeup, <laughs> um, your makeup routine, and what you're wearing, and what you're... We can, if you'd like. Oh, let's start I, with that. What okay. do you... like? Um, if we could zoom in on Crisol's face, oh gosh, like, listen. So um, I, you know what? I'm only want, willing to talk about it because I did this in the car. As, so, Stop. As a musician... I wish I looked like that when as, I did my makeup in the car. As a musician, I have perfected the, um, the, the quick 15 minute in my driver's seat, like, routine um sometimes i've had to do it while the car's moving oh my god don't try that at home that's talent that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. talent <laughs> yeah the eyeliner while you're driving is right crazy. Yeah. um but i didn't i didn't do eyeliner today because i was like listen the where the sun was at the glare i've i've, I've done all the um, <laughs> the research uh, yeah uh no dude it's a simple routine uh you know what? I, a lot of i have a mix of like drugstore and like some expensive stuff okay it's all pretty much drugstore stuff right now though are you but, wearing like, face makeup uh, did you put like the NYX concealer? They have that. Listen, like, you like, look like you're airbrushed, and I have astigmatism. I'm sure that's not affecting the way I'm looking at you, but you literally are glowing. I'm like, what only baddies have astigmatism. I also struggle with astigmatism. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's that NYX. Um, it's that new. They have like a serum concealer or something like that. Um, it's really nice. I need to look that up. Uh, it's just, I just I just do the concealer stuff, and then I put a little setting powder on there, and then um, the Fenty contour stick. Still using the. He hell out of that one i don't know if i'm allowed to cuss my mom's gonna oh be please do my mom's gonna be mad if i do oh the first episode <laughs> i came home and my dad said how the fuck is anyone gonna hire you and i said wow who did i get it from sir truly honestly <laughs> um yeah and then yeah just a little contour and then uh the um the laura mercier that's my expensive they have a bronzer uh that oh, i use that's the expensive i was laundry. gonna say I, i'm a recent fan of their setting powder oh yeah, that's yeah yeah so their their stuff i mean i would love to afford like a full face of them because their their concealer i've heard is also really good. yeah um i'm not a makeup person but this is what i use because i have to you know i i can't afford a glam team so i'd be doing my own glam i feel that um but my like kind of lip liner like ombre look this is eyeshadow the fenty yeah, yeah, I did this with a little, a thin precision brush. and um, You better work in the car. In the car. You got skills because I too am not, um, I do liner and lip is my biggest thing, but I've been trying to figure out, you also must have amazing skin. Because <laughs> I just feel like I could put on, uh, yeah. <laughs> I just have a little concealer, I would look like a walking Casper. Or I, 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 I do, look, I, I do take care of my skin. I also did get lucky in that department, I will say, but uh, sunscreen, 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 yes, sunscreen. Also a hydration. new fan of that. Yeah, yeah, hy hydration. Um, I've been on the hunt for the like i had a perfect sunscreen and i think i'm going to continue to buy it if i can somehow manage to but um what is it crave beauty oh um, i use super goop okay super goop's great i actually that's my kind of that's my the second. the mattifying one that like is also a primer yeah love that yeah i use that one um but the one from crave beauty it's this company, they're super it's k-r-a-v-e mm -hmm. super ethical company all of their packaging if you're really into that sorry excuse me <laughs> is really like eco-friendly and it's all recyclable materials mm -hmm. and a lot of their proceeds go to actually saving the great barrier reef so they have mm -hmm. got but they've got like a a really great they've got a, a great serum called the great barrier relief that i use for a long time especially when like i was uh, like in, in, like the beginning stages of covid with all yeah. the mask adjustments mm -hmm. like because we'd be breaking out so that helped and then but they had this beat shield sunscreen that is acceptable as an spf everywhere else in the world except the united states and it was what? acceptable here 
but then the FDA somehow some there's some qualification that it didn't meet here. And it's beet, like, like it has beets in it? Yeah, or? it has beets in it, but it's like, there's no white cast. It had the most dreamiest formula. Like, it was just like, it smelled good. Like, well, it wasn't super fragranced either, but it was still just felt very, very refreshing. So we got to smuggle it, is what you're saying? Basically. I got to go. Where is it go from? Find, um, I think, well, I think the company's from Australia, if I'm oh. correct. But, um, like, I, I, there's a there's a few, like, skin influencers that I followed that, that are in the UK. And they're like, I'm using it. I don't care. Like, Dang. <laughs> like, I need to look into that. Yeah, no. It, uh, Crave Beauty is a great brand. I, I really, like, uh, that skincare for me, you know, our, our Latina mothers are constantly, when we were younger, like, stay out of the sun, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, they were doing all the research because, like, they were all, you know, they were yeah. out of the like, sun damage and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, they feel like skincare uh, and, like, just particular ingredients, my mom was always, like, really on me about when I was Mm -hmm. young and then just like my obsession with it kind of uh, went from there flourished I love how we started with this because we could just talk about this for hours honestly Um, but let's get into you as an amazing superstar musician beautiful queen Mm. the first time I saw you perform was in Selenamos am I saying it right yep at Las Cafeteras a show at Los Globos oh my god it was ages ago I think it was 2017 yeah and that's the last time I saw you perform because I'm trash, clearly, and I'm not up on game on the coolest things happening on the block. Well, you're going to see me Check on Sunday. You. Yes, I am. I'm super excited. Yeah. But tell us about this journey as a musician. You're yeah. so amazing. I remember I was into it. You played La Chica de la Part- El Chico, La Chica. Look at me. Which, that would be cute. Hey, listen, we should... This- that would be cute. Listen, ideas are happening. Um, <laughs> but you did such a good job and you turned us all the way up at Thank that you. day when I saw you. But Thank I want to know about how you got there. How did you become this amazing performer? Um, well, thanks to Selena, I was I was uh, a wee pup of five years old. I saw her, um, you know, she, my, my sister was a fan of hers when I was little. Um, I... But she was actually the first artist that I was like, this is a job. Because mm. I would always like like think like, okay, I'm going to be a singer but I also have to be like a teacher. Yeah. Like I didn't know that there was like, I don't know how much work it would take. Yeah. I was just like, cool, I'll just like make a couple songs. People would be like, oh my God, oh my God you're amazing. Yeah. Like I thought Shakira had a day job. Like, <laughs> like she'd just sing on the side. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so but but for real, like Selena and then like the, and then uh, just the concept of her, I was like, no, this is like a job. Like you can mm-hmm. do this. And so I always just tell people I've known what I wanted to do since I was five. That's, yeah. And um, and really it's also like the path that she was on with, with like she was just breaking out into acting, mm-hmm. singing both English and Spanish. So like I'm very much like uh, following in those exact footsteps, like that's trying awesome. to diversify and create um, and just be it, be a performer. Because that's really what she is. She is a dynamo performer. Like she's a performer with what she wore, with how she sang and how she danced, mm-hmm. with how she presented herself in interviews. Like she really knew how to make people feel something all yeah. the time. And I love that about her. Um, so I studied her for a long time, but then, you know, you, you grow up, you learn about other music mm-hmm. and, um, I, you know, being, being first generation, like I just listened to, we, I mean, I'm sure you have a similar experience growing up, but you just listen to so many different genres mm-hmm. of music because, you know, uh, how does it like in the Selena movie, like we have to be more American than the Americans and more Mexican than the yeah. Mexicans. So we have this, like our Spotify playlists are insane. No, a thousand percent. And then the second I found out I can sing and then musical theater came in the picture and I wasn't a theater kid. I, 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 wish I, was, I was about to say, are we about to get into musical theater? No, we and- can though, because I studied it, but like I decided to play soccer. Mm-hmm. Low key was kind of bullied into playing soccer by my brothers, but it, it worked out. Like I, I really did love being an athlete, but I probably, had they not been like play sports, I probably would have been in drama club. Yeah, listen, stuff. we had the opposite experience. <laughs> I wanted to be in cross country but then this world of, I went to an all-girls Catholic school in San Gabriel. Mm. And they were like, oh, the auditions are coming up. And I've just I've always been a performer. Like, I wanted to ask you, which we'll get into after this. But, like, my, uh, I remember being a performing. I, there was a mic. I'd grab it too, right? But I'm not a yeah. performer like you. But it was the opposite. And, like, I quit sports because I was like, the drama. And now <laughs> it's, like, now it's translating into me, like, enjoying hosting and doing yeah, things like this. Yeah. But for you, you're a whole-ass performer. Do you, have an, do you have a memory of when you first performed? I know you said five years old. Did you ever yeah. do things yeah. for your family? Oh, no. I was con- oh. Did I? <laughs> okay, I didn't realize that we all had the same childhood, but the way that I would be like, Mom, I need you to drop me off at my cousin's house on like Monday or whatever. This is like summer break. I'm yeah. like, and you're going to pick me up Saturday and we're going to have a whole show rehearsed. A whole concert. Concert, baby. I and love- like, I was militant. We were up. I was like, hey, we got to get up eight tomorrow for rehearsals. <laughs> 
we were thinking about our outfits, like trying on like you know her mom, my 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 tia's clothes, the or props, whatever. the stage management. Oh my god, the the set list. <laughs> I'm like, cool, cool. This is the song we're gonna dance together. You can perform this song, but I'm gonna close. <laughs> and if so and so fucks up by pressing next on the CD or doesn't bring in the pillow when they're supposed to, oh, they're yeah. fucking fired. Yeah. And we made. We're not yeah, talking. Absolutely. Yeah. I really I lost a lot of family members. In that. It was a it was a harsh <laughs> business. Um, and then we would make like flyers for like the, oh, for my grandma because like because where my where my aunt lived it was actually it's a it was in Riverside and um their house is connected so my aunt's house connected my grandmother's house so there's oh, a fence okay. between them so like we would have rehearsals on one side of the house and we go to the other house like we just like felt like okay we need to go meet over at grandma's house yeah because what's the vibe because we need to eat yeah <laughs> so we're gonna, she's gonna make us some food and we're gonna discuss like production it was really I dumb. love it yeah so yeah no but sure. hey listen it's what guided you here exactly I think. yeah no and it was very innate like mm-hmm. the like the 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 need to like be a little star i was just really into that um and like make people smile and sing Mm -hmm. loud and all that stuff so uh and then as far as like any gigs like i don't know i grew up yeah i'm from the ie i'm from chino so um and there's i'm always around chino right now my partner's from pomona so i feel like i'm all up deep and around p-town and i'm like what y'all got over here yeah yeah. chino's cute it's like a nice little it's a little suburb like it's Mm -hmm. very but i feel like chino at the time or like in the 70s and 80s was what like victorville and like like San Bernardino County was mm-hmm. where like a lot of people in LA were like, ah, we're going to go East to like calm down, get yeah. to go buy some houses, all that stuff. And so there's a nice like third, fourth generation Chicano presence there. Yeah. I really liked it growing up. Um, and, but it's like a cute little suburb and there's like a lot of different little economies within it. I don't yeah. know. I, I, it was, it was nice growing up there. And, and, um, yeah, like as far, but as far as like performing, it's not mm-hmm. like I, I trip out like when I meet for other, cause I'm first gen too. So mm-hmm. I was around growing up around a lot of third, third, fourth generation kids and, being in LA and people are like, oh yeah, like I've been organizing with my mom my whole life, or I've been performing because like I, you know, you're in LA and there's it, or I've been doing folklorico since I was yeah. two, and I'm like, I played Tony Hawk Pro Skater <laughs> like with my <laughs> like with for my, fun, with right? My neighbors, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's so true. I never thought about that. Yeah, so like, like, there's so much talent here, and folks have been doing the work for a while, for a long time. So like, you know, so it makes me feel better that I was so drawn to it because mm-hmm. I'm like. I was in a vacuum, you know, and like we had like drama club and all that stuff. So like anything I could do, like um, I would audition for like national anthems or like hmm. when I was like little, like God bless America's whatever. Right? Yeah, like whatever I, was there. I, I actually sang at every single one of my school commencement ceremonies. And I'm talking like sixth grade, eighth, middle school, high school, college. Like I did, that's beautiful. Yeah, I, got a, I got a royal a full house. Yeah, that one. Uh, royal flesh. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, anything I could volunteer for, and I started songwriting at, like, 13, um, just, I begged for a guitar, I was like, I'm ready to be Regina Spector, or, like, Ingrid Michaelson. I loved Regina Spector. <laughs> Again, suburb kid, so I was growing up, growing up around, like, all the emo music, yeah. like, I'm like, I was, uh, Ingrid Michaelson, um, yeah, I don't know, like, a little, uh, I had more set, it was yeah. fun, it was fun. <laughs> So I was just ready to be like a little singer songstress and then um, ended up just making like bands and just honed in on the craft as best as I could. Like again, like the uh, the IE and then it started, I had to do pay to play shows. Or the mm. Pay to play shows are basically like a venue hits you up. It's really a promoter that fills up the empty nights of the venue and mm. it's like, hey, like if you want to perform here, you have to sell 40 Your tickets. tickets, yeah. But AKA you need to pay us $400 to to play here Ugh. but i was but like me like i was like well this, I, this is my time I yeah need to show. it's your it's your opportunity to practice so, but so little five-year-old me who would like pass out flyers to my theas or whatever now i'm like hitting up like strangers what are you doing this friday yeah you want to you want to go to the <laughs> want to come through you want to go to the wire in upland <laughs> off of second street right. yeah um <laughs> So yeah, that's what I got, like, that's where that's where my inner businesswoman really started. Yeah, <laughs> started you out profession. here thriving in so many ways. Very very entrepreneurial. <laughs> Do you have an alter ego when you're on stage? Because you know Beyonce. I don't know if you're a fan of Beyonce. She has oh, yeah. Sasha Fierce. Am I a fan you're, of Beyonce? You know we got, we had a check. We yeah, had a yeah, check. We make sure. Yeah, it's like a it's like a personality. Test. Yeah, I'm a Sagittarius and a Beyonce fan. Listen, I love Sagittarius and I love people who love Beyonce. So you're my friend. I'm here for it. Excellent. Look at us. <laughs> um, yeah. So with the. Um, uh my alter ego ego. there Mm -hmm. we go my alter ego um not so much when i'm on stage i mean there's just a heightened version of crisol Mm -hmm. um i because i do i do feel a sense of really good a good sense of control when i'm on stage like no matter how insecure i am off about how i may look at that point or whatever it Mm -hmm. is like you know the things you go through as a woman every Every day i'm on stage i look in the mirror every day uh, (laughs) um but uh, um i'm like oh god why couldn't i have my mom's legs like you know like all the the bullshit (laughs) we're just like (laughs) and we probably look popping but it's just like in the mirror it's like wow a monster today's ogre okay (laughs) okay yeah look at her right look at this is who we are today (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's like, uh, but the second I get on stage, I'm like, all right, that all goes away. And like, cause I, and I feel good at this version mm-hmm. of me. That feels, I feel the most complete when I'm performing. That's so, awesome. so it's not so much I need to put myself away. It's just, I let myself be who I am. And, but when I go, you going out, Carmen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, so like when you're in nightlife. When I'm nightlife. <laughs> I'm Veronica. No. <laughs> I don't know where the fuck Veronica came from, but it was a name I started using when guys would be like, what's your name? I'd be like, Veronica. Like, fuck you. You can't know my real name. I don't know who you are. Yeah, Carmen is like Who's my, Carmen? Carmen is like the name. Because like, you're in a loud bar and you're like, what's your name? And I'm like, I'm Crisol or Crisol. And they're like, mm. Crystal? <laughs> Priscilla? <laughs> a guy, swear to God, was like, Croissant? And not I'm like, croissant. I'm like, he must have been drunk or I too, hungry. I too am buttery and delicious, but yeah. not in that way. Um. We're here for it. Okay, you said I could be your croissant in different ways. <laughs> yeah, like so. I'm just like when I don't feel like um, ex- when I just know, you know, you mm-hmm. know, when it's just like a conversation. You're like, all right, have a Carmen. great Carmen. Yeah, or Chris. It just depends. Chris. Yeah, yeah. I love your name, by the way, Crisol. Is there a name? Behind, is there a story behind it? Um, I think my mom was in too much pain to spell Crystal correctly. No. Uh, oh, okay. I was about to say. <laughs> No, uh, it was, uh, from what I'm told, so there's, I, I think I might be an oopsie baby. This is a five year gap mm-hmm. between me and my brother. They're all like one, two years apart. And then there's me. Um, and I guess in between that time, my mom was like, you know, you just like think about the kid you might have one day. Yeah. I don't know, which I was like, you're trying to have a fourth one. You're right. Think, right. You're thinking about her. Okay. <laughs> but she just stumbled upon this name. Apparently it, it is like a, a Bible name. Like there's mm-hmm. or like a story um, of like a, and I, I think it's spelled like um, sometimes like a C R Y, at least in the in the format that she found it. Um, it's like this name that translated to uh, my greatest treasure or something like that. Mm, she thought it was so beautiful. pretty. Yeah, so it's spelled like, but then it also means crucible, which I found this out recently. In wow. Span, in like Spain, it's used often, but it's like C R I S O L without the H is spelled. It, it translates to crucible. So I'm like, oh, no wonder I can't. So indecisive. It's like a mix of a bunch <laughs> of stuff. Um, and uh yeah so that's so it's supposed to be like some treasure thing that she found and she just like would like write it down i feel like mm-hmm. she like manifested me a little bit because she like she'd write your name down write my name in like little different ways and then ultimately decided if i have a daughter i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna i'm gonna spell it with h that way like i'm just gonna make people think about it twice she literally so said that like i want wow. people to like think about your name let's make her life harder exactly <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I feel like it's enjoyable to be able to correct somebody and like oh, it, that exchange for me is sometimes special. Unless someone's being blatantly disrespectful. I, I hate Laura. I'm all, every single time I introduce myself, oh, hi, I'm Laura, not Laura. And people will still do it and that shit pisses me off. But I, I find some kind of like greatness in being like, oh, it's actually Laura. Well, it's a, yeah, and it's a great like way to catch people like like the, you're not gonna catch me slipping about how you're gonna address me because it, it exactly. makes you know it's a it's a great way to like establish your own confidence and they can tell and people can really read a lot off of you mm-hmm. hey no this is how you say my name yeah so i i'm constantly like actually it's crystal yeah hi. or like they'll be like crystal and i'm like hi it's crystal like yeah. then i like grab just their so hand you know. all firm and i'm like yeah yeah just like, know it yeah from now on <laughs> let's get into los angeles so yeah. now what neighborhood do you rep now uh, right. Okay. So right now I'm repping actually Corona. Corona. Uh, because, okay. Because uh, I live with family right now. Okay. The pandemic survival move. Uh, That's before, real. I did spend um, you know, group in Chino mm. and then I moved to Commerce. I was living in Commerce for many years okay. and I loved it there. I loved Commerce. It's um, down the street from my house in East uh, Los. Uh, I, I just love that area. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just like the... I don't know. Like, it just, the hustle is beautiful. My, my godmother grew up. My, so I spent a lot of time in City Terrace when I was a kid. That's um, where I grew up. Okay, yeah. So my godmother lives uh, not like right near. Um, she goes to that. What's that church called? I was just there the other day. St. Lucy's. St. Lucy's. Mm-hmm. So she she's like a involved. She's like a deep or what is what is she's like on the guard or whatever. Like the um, oh okay like on the, in that like she's like in, in that church. yeah. <laughs> so like, but that's where my, you know my Nina. I spent time in City Terrace. I have super fond memories. Like going to her place. Like so it's bouncing between like her place, Chino. A lot of time in Riverside. Where You're from kid. all over. Kind of, yeah. Mm. And um, I mean, my, my siblings are all born in L.A. County. And mm. then, again, five-year gap. My mom moved to Ontario, and then I was born. So oh. like we're, so that's where our, a lot of our immediate family was in L.A. for a long time. And then, um, so yeah, City Terrace. Lived in Commerce with me and my brother. We had this house. It was awesome. I loved it. It was, it was a little, the house was... Was the house was not in a good shape. I used to say I had like twenty eight roommates because like, we were just like mice and like. Oh no! But my rent was super cheap. I, but I was like, eh, the, the, front, know, the struggle the, is real. The front sometimes. door didn't really close. It was bad. Um, you know, we need those experiences to make us who we yeah, are. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But we had like neighborhood security. You know. Oh okay, yeah. See, 
Yeah. There's pros, there's cons. It was great. They'd call me like, hey, like, like I think one time my dog got out. They were like, they called me immediately. They're like, hey, we saw your dog get out. We, we're trying, we're going to go get him. I'm and like, you can't get that anywhere else. No else. No one else gives a fuck. It's community. It, right. That's why I liked it. Um, <laughs> Do you have a favorite taco in Los Angeles? I can't believe how fast time passed with oh, you. And so we, I know you're like, wait, this question. <laughs> <laughs> already dang um yeah i do have a favorite taco it's uh so la descarga in uh Ooh, hollywood that sounds like a deep ass name so so it's actually the nightclub there oh. right and i don't know specifically what the name of the taco spot is it's on the internet it says tacos el patio or i think tacos el chasqui but el it's, chasqui it's, it's, it's or literally patio. yeah it's literally the taco spot that's right next to la descarga i i ate there yesterday it's what my, about it makes it special it's and just, what taco do you like? Uh, you know, I, that's important. I get, a, I get a mulita or a queso mm. taco uh, with either asada or al pastor, um, depend, depending on my mood. Um, but it's just every time I go, it smacks. It's consistent. They're always open. Um, like all night? All, yeah, till like 3 in the morning. Okay, I'm yeah. going to look it up. La descarga next to it. Yeah. We love it. <laughs> well, what can we look forward to next? Like, uh, I am a huge fan of your music. I wanted you. to talk about your... Uh, the Marihuanera theme song. Oh, yeah. When I tell you that that song brings me so much joy every time I put on the episodes. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. you want to sing a little bit of something oh for us? Oh, my God. Uh, sure. Uh, see. She's a depressed 20-something with a college degree who copes with life by smoking too much weed. Dodging hey. cochinos as she rolls down the street. She's la Marihuanera as seen on IG. You better work. <laughs> I wanted to tell you, your range is everything. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I feel you. like you hit all the notes oh, all the time. I practice them, yeah. Um, no, the money one, look, all, all credit due. Mala had the lyrics out. She was like, this is what I want to hear in the song. She gave me a motif, like it was very like nanny vibes. Yeah. And she just came over and we were diddling around. I have and, goosebumps. Yeah. We that wrote, was so good. Even the snippet right now. <laughs> and we wrote it together and like, the, and then I was like, hey, what do you think? It's a little like, I like, love The little it. end part and she loved it. So literally we had that song done in a week. Like it was a very cool, like I, I, we composed it really quick. I took it to the Brown Boys. Um, Eliza does his little thing like, oh yeah, mommy. Like, <laughs> which that little snippet that t like, hey, let me be your dog. That actually happened to Mala. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like that. <laughs> let me be your let dog. Let me be your dog. She, I mean, it was because, you know, she often talks about her dog walking chronicles. And, like, that was a real moment that happened to her. So it's why just, are men like this? Why are men? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so we, we we banged it out real quick. The Brown Boys are super talented. We're going to make some more. And the, also, we did do the instrumental jingle, the little, like, reggaeton beat. We're going to hire you to do something for LA Taco Live. Hey. Because, listen, that vibe is everything. You heard her. I'm here for it. We got to make it happen. Let's, we I'm have to it. make it I'm happen. Ready. Yeah, so... So uh, gonna make some more music for Marihuana. I'd actually would really like to. I don't. Sorry, my life. I'm not allowed to talk about it. But I like. <laughs> I'd like to actually make like an EP of songs for her uh, awesome. around around those projects and explore doing more stuff like that for podcasts um, or just programming. You know, get into like syncing and and making music for TV. Yes. Um, I'd also like to be on TV. So if you're casting, let me know. You better uh, manifest it because you deserve <laughs> to no, be on yeah, TV. I did. Yeah. The, the pandemic. I did a few short films. I've always wanted to act. I was like, I'm gonna be a famous singer and then I'm gonna start acting. Yes. But then I was like, oh, my God, I can't sing right now. So, <laughs> so I was like, let me just go be an actor. Like, well, not and you just did go. it. Yeah, I did. I did a few, do a few short films um, over over the pandemic because I was the first kind of uh, being on set was the mm -hmm. first thing to get back to it. And I was really lucky that I was able to get cast on some cool stuff with some local, um, you know, local Latino um, talent that directors. Mm -hmm. So that was I've been lucky with that. And I've just been taking acting classes and trying to get. And also, like, it's kind of like, they're, I mean, they're, they're one and the same, right? The the acting and the character work that I do for, um, you know, for, for that job mm -hmm. kind of translates into the songwriting. So I'm also working on an album and trying to work on a concept and stories it's and so visuals. Badass. So it's like, yeah. it's all intertwined. It seems like, oh, singer, actress, dancer. Wow. She's dynamic. But it really is like, it's all just one performer. Mm -hmm. And and if you look at the people that, at least all of, all of my idols, like Gaga and, and Beyonce and Shakira and Selena, like all <laughs> these women were so deeply involved in like you know in in every part of performing yeah like, it, it's, it's like them at the center of it so yeah. that's what i'd like to do and so uh, to look forward to i'm performing you know at the local yes uh, sunday at locatora at, at I'm a, why am i like tripping like stuttering at the locatora radio five-year anniversary yeah at, yeah. Res at resident downtown yes. la um i love that venue they're so they're so good to me Estela Namos is also going to be there yeah we are actually this is actually the first announcement of it but we're going to do april 16th is selena's birthday and we're performing at resident. Listen, I'm gonna buy tickets. Yeah, I gotta yeah. be there. Yeah, so I we're, gotta gonna, be there. We're, it's gonna, we're gonna we're gonna announce it next week, but officially on on, on socials and everything. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. If um, it's one thing Crisol does is put on a motherfucking show, especially with Selena. Aside from like all of your great music too. Thank you. Yeah. 
We're going to continue to be fans. I also know your screenwriting, so we have a lot to look forward to when it comes to everything that Crisol does. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. If this you don't buy great. tickets, thank you. Yeah. If you don't buy tickets to Locatora Radio, you're fucking fake. I said it here. I mean it, okay? Make sure you catch us there. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next week, y'all. Take care. Bye. <laughs> that was so awesome. Oh, sorry that went so fast.